the lifespan that we currently have is probably 10% of what it had been. Mm -hmm. And that that really prevents the, the capacity to move into kind of a spiritual maturation, that we're in a spiritual childhood for most of life, unless, unless we're really able to awaken. And after awakening, do the do the hard carry steps, mm -hmm. you know, to be, take a disciplined path to w keep walking forward rather than feeling like once you're awakened, you're awakened because that's not on this planet. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is Edmund Knighton. Edmund is one of the leading American scholars on anthroposophy, which is the teachings and insights of Rudolf Steiner, as well as a seasoned clinical psychologist specializing in neuropsychology and family systems. He has four decades of experience as a community leader, Waldorf teacher, yoga instructor and movement coach with a speciality in Haikomi, a therapeutic practice which aims to unlock unconscious belief systems through body awareness and mindfulness training. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review on the podcast platform of your choice. Your opinions matter and your ratings help us to grow and help more people to be healthy, find freedom of body and mind, and to live their dreams. A big thank you to our premier sponsors, Bioptimizers, Paleo Valley and Organifi, and our podcast sponsors, Ned and Wild Pastures. Their support is essential in producing this podcast, and we hope you will show your support by visiting them online and trying all the amazing products they produce. Please check the show notes for links and details at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. The topic of today's conversation between Paul and Edmund is Ra and Steiner. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, we have a super interesting guest with a very interesting topic, which is Ra and Steiner. If you heard my Lucifer Christ Aramon podcast, you will know I spoke about Ra, told you who Ra was, and you also know that a lot of that podcast was based on Steiner's prophecies for the future and for now. And it's a potent podcast if you haven't listened to it. And Edmund is a very unique man who has a lot of background in the study of Ra and Steiner, has taught in Waldorf schools. His wife's been a Waldorf school teacher for 35 years. And I must say, he's a fun guy to hang out with. <laughs> he likes my library. That means he's a cool dude. And so uh, we're going to have a conversation today on many very deep, important topics. And we're going to look at the raw perspective relative to Steiner's perspective on each of these key topics, which are the topics that are the core of human existence. So, Edmund, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. You have a good morning. I had a beautiful morning. <laughs> at the rainbow. Yes. Edmund and I started our day with some deep spiritual discussion and hanging out together and breakfast, and then we lifted stones together and did a nice sauna and a cold plunge to get ready and had lunch, and here we are, ready to rock and roll. Yeah. So, uh, Edmund, first of all, congratulations for being a stud in the cold plunge, 42 degrees. You hung out there for quite a while. Yeah, I'm, it was delicious. <laughs> <laughs> You're, I always giggle because a lot of my guests, they're like, oh, I'll try the cold plunge. And then they're in there for like three seconds and they're out. They haven't even gotten wet and they're out of there. <laughs> so <laughs> when you were in there, I was giggling because some of the big stud athletes that come up here, they're, they're often challenged to stay in there even for a minute. And here's my Steiner master <laughs> hanging out in there like it's no problem. <laughs> Well, I'm I'm grateful to my my teacher for helping me stay warm in there. Right? <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, spiritual warmth, inner warmth. Yes, yeah, yeah. To begin with, Edmund, to kind of help people connect to who you are, because you're also a clinical psychologist. You've got a lot of experience and a lot of background on different things. Love it if you can just take the guests on sort of an experience of your life all the developmental milestones and things that sort of shaped you into the man that you are. And then we'll unleash the dragon of Edmund Knighton <laughs> with Raw and Steiner's perspectives, because I think this is going to be a fun and interesting podcast that people will probably listen to multiple times and share a lot, I hope. Oh, I hope so. I hope it's worthwhile. Oh, I'm sure it is. Yeah. You're here, baby. All right. So yeah, 
tell us tell us your story. I'd love to hear it myself. Okay. All right. Well, uh, my story started with really. I think I designed for myself a, a a host of experiences early in life. Yeah. And so the the long and the short of that for childhood would have been uh, eight marriages in the in the first years of life before I left home at fifteen. And so I got eight marriages. What do you mean? Well, my my both my parents just were married four times. Oh wow! So so it gave me an opportunity to experience a lot of different possibilities. Wow! Uh, for what it's like to be parented and what it's like not to be parented. And here you are, married thirty five years. That's you went the other way. I did go the other way. I took I took a good long time to make sure that I was worthy of my wife. Mm, good. Uh, it took me eight years to to pop the question, <laughs> but. Uh, but yes, and and now we have a sweet little twelve year old boy who's just the joy of my life. Great, yeah. So so that experience in in childhood gave me the opportunity to to feel uh, a number of different things. But some of the challenging things would be more more like neglect, um, and I would say a kind of emotional infancy on the part of uh, some of those dads, uh, and then on the other extreme, from from neglect or indifference to uh, emotional just kind of numbness would be uh, a hot-headedness. So we had we had a couple of folks who liked to beat up the whole family. Mm. And you know, those were things that were difficult for for me to experience and not only for myself but also for for my brothers and sisters and my mother. How many brothers and sisters have you got? Well, my mom had five kids. Wow. Uh, and then her with her with her last husband, he had 3. And then we had some coming in and out with the other marriages. Mm -hmm. And so I have an older brother and sister who are lovely folks and uh, a younger brother and sister. Mm. So I'm in the middle with my mom, but I, got, I had a different dad because I was, I was dad number two. Mm, I see. So I was the eldest of three in that area mm -hmm. and then the youngest on the other family. So in, in Steiner circles, I actually have the, the gift of being the oldest child, the youngest child, and the middle child. That's interesting. And there's a lot to, to what Steiner has to say about uh, how you come forward in the world when you have one of those things. But when you have the opportunity to live all three, one of the things I think it has given me is, is an, a kind of a resilience mm -hmm. and adaptability mm -hmm. and an openness to, to choose the, the kind of, to choose the lead card that I need to play when I need to play it, rather than being locked into the sort of the first child syndrome, the, mm -hmm. the old uber responsible one. And I think it's, I think it's put me in good stead when I, when I came to Steiner's work, but I'll, I'll leave that for just a moment because that came a little later. But, but I would say that, that probably gives just a quick snapshot of my childhood until, until I left home. And then I went to, uh, I went to school. I was uh, 17. Uh, I went to a school called New College, a little tiny little school down in South Florida, right by the beach, mm. which, which for me was, I thought would be a beautiful idea because we used to vacation down there, but it turned out to be a little bit of a distraction for me. I didn't realize that these young kids were sort of the best and the brightest, but they also were some of the uh, most in-depth drug takers I've ever experienced. Uh, and that's saying a lot because in age nine, my babysitter got me drunk and high for the first time and threw me in the indoor pool in Philadelphia. And then the next time he came, he brought his girlfriend over and we did some lemons and roars and he threw me in the outdoor pool. And we used to do all sorts of things when we were younger. But the, the depth of the mind altering that was taking place at New College was, was new for me, even with that uh, background. But I always found myself to be very curious, very experimental with consciousness. So I, I tried everything. I wanted to see what it was. And thank goodness I didn't have uh, the addictive personality or I may have, I may still be doing some of those, yeah. some of those drugs. It happens for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I attended that, uh, that college. That was sort of the heyday of the Rick Doblin getting started. He was, a he was at New College at that time. And so I, I learned a tremendous about about uh, what again what not to do if you want to stay in college <laughs> <laughs> or maybe even in the world <laughs> or maybe even in the world yeah and it and and it got worse from there mm. uh, I ended up buying a significant amount of MDMA and LSD and cocaine and and then I got dismissed from the school as you could imagine mm -hmm. and then I had a warrant out and I had to leave the state and so I went north and I just started kind of traveling around a little bit. I ended up getting disowned by both sets of parents, so mm. that was uh, that was challenging. But yeah. it was it was the the path I was headed down. So I started just following the dead around and going to rainbow gatherings, and 
uh, I met a guy who had a plane and it had it was just about uh, harmonic conversions time. So we flew over to the Yucatan Peninsula during that time. And turned out he lived in a pyramid, which uh, Neat. I thought that was a pretty cool thing. Mm-hmm. But as I was traveling around, and, and uh, I was just really completely lost. I was completely lost. I wasn't capable of having a relationship with you know with a friend or with a with a woman. This was what age? Um, after I got dismissed, I would have turned. Uh, it would have been b- the beginning of uh, yeah, about eighteen. Mm-hmm. And so. So I just traveled around the country, just sort of lost. I went to a dead show in Buffalo and some uh, young lady said, hey, you know, I really like that peace earring. Would you drive us to Boulder? And I said, sure. So we got in the car and went to Boulder. So that was what life was like for me (laughs) at that point, Uh, just traveling around. And I, you know, stayed in a big house with seven girls going to UC. And that was wonderful for a few weeks Mm -hmm. before I moved on and uh, and then I decided it was time to, to score a really big score of marijuana. So I ended up down in Anaheim. When I woke up with the guy that I was going to do the score with, I found out that not only was he gone, but so was all of my stash and my weapon. And oh, my, my God. Yeah. So I was just sitting there thinking, well, I'm not really sure what happens now. And there was a young woman there who said, well, I'm going to turn a trick here, and uh, you can just have the room after I turn the trick. And I said, well, that sounds great because I don't have any money. I don't have a place to stay. And she said, all you got to do is just you know, hide in the closet and take the guy's wallet and and uh, I said, you know, I, I think I'm going to pass on that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was just a drug dealer until today, but I, I, I do have some morals. Yeah. And she said, well, you can have the room anyway. And she ended up taking me in with her brother, who was agoraphobic, and then her younger brother, who was the light of the family, who was a cocaine dealer. So he, Agro- Agoraphobic, is that? He can't leave the house. Oh. Yeah. Mm. And so it was, it was a beautiful family, but they couldn't afford to feed me. And so after a couple of weeks, they said, hey, God bless and move on. So that's when uh, I just hitchhiked down here, actually, down to San Diego and right. ended up in Balboa Park for a few months, just sleeping there. And somebody took me in and I was selling pottery for this guy for a while, but he was, he was also, he was manic and uh, I won't go into the, the story, but it was an exciting one and ended up poorly for him. And I realized I now no longer had a place to stay anymore. Right. So I just backpacked through Mexico. And then I realized it was time for me to to figure out how you get up from rock bottom, from having no family connections, no friends, no inner life, and just really no sense of what's next. Mm. And so I went back uh, to my family and I wrote a letter and I made contact and they were gracious. And that was about, you know, toward, toward the middle of my 18th year. And I decided I would reapply to new college and I reapplied and I got back in and I went down there, but something was telling me that what I had been through was leading to something else, not Mm. college. And so one of the guys from New College there, he had a, a, far, a garden. He had, well, it was 84 acres. It was a, a farm. Mm-hmm. And he said, would you like to live out there on the land? Would you like to garden? And I said, yeah, that is that is what I would like to do. So I, I went out there and I started living on the land. And he was independently wealthy. So he was able to feed this food with kelp and um, fish emulsion. I mean, it was just the most blessed soil you could imagine. Because he didn't care how much he spent on it. And I started eating this fruit and I didn't want anything else. It was so highly energized and he was, yeah, he was an interesting cat that I just eventually started eating watermelon. And where was this at? That was in Sarasota. So I went back to Sarasota heading for the college, but ended up not quite getting there and ending up a half hour out of town. And I ended up just eating watermelon for six months. It was this yellow fleshed watermelon and I wasn't. It wasn't a, like a conscious intent to be a fruitarian, but I was, I was nourished. My emotional life came, came out of numbness. My thinking life had clarity. My relationships had sensitivity. I had tremendous energy. Mm. And I just thought, wow, this is, this is really incredible. And right about that time, they took on another farmhand who was a real character. I seem to be around a lot of real characters. And he just kept telling me about this, this guy that I had to go see whose name was Chief. And I'd, I'd never been one to follow a guru or be interested in something like that. And so I just, I thought it was kind of a hoax, you know, calling somebody chief and that you should go see them. But for some reason, he just kept saying, I really needed to, to meet this man. And I finally did. I finally went with him. And the moment I saw him, I realized this guy's the real deal. Mm. 
it was he was like a mountain of a man shining at the top and so much like, like this booming voice but also such sensitivity and such innocence that came along with it and i just said something is here and so i sat down and it was a just like a i don't know kind of a class or a council or something like mm -hmm. that and he sat down with this book was he an indian man yeah he turned out to be um his name is as it was he died uh, chief Little Summer, and he was he was the Hawk Clan chief for the Shawnee Nation, which was originally called Shawandasi or South Wind Clan, so, and that's of Mayan heritage. So they came over from uh, the Yucatan Peninsula to Florida. They ended up up in the hills of uh, of Ohio and in the Midwest there, Indiana, and then he was asked to come back down to Florida because, uh, as his picture. Uh, of the earth chakras was this was the second chakra the power chakra the orange chakra of growth and transformation and there's no mantle there and he was he was guided to be the the guardian of that uh, of that chakra for the, for the earth mm -hmm. and so that's where he ended up and as he was opening this book it was this this beautiful cover and it said the law of one on it ah there's i've been waiting for that yeah and it turned out he was consciously a six density being who was able not only he didn't read the the text so much as he used it as a reference point and mm -hmm. then he would uh, look up and and begin to share with us uh, from whatever experience he had of, of of consciously being in a place of wisdom uniting with love. Uh, I immediately knew that this was material that I. I recognized, even though I'd never heard it before. I come from a Judeo-Christian background. So one parent was Jewish, the other was was Christian. So I got to experience monotheism, but uh, not quite the kind of monotheism that the Law of One espouses. No, yeah, no. <laughs> I've always, I've always joked. I said it's funny how we have three Abrahamic religions that all practice monotheism, but none of them can agree on the mono of God. And you got three religions in a monotheistic concept. That's a, that should alert people from the beginning. It's there's, an oxymoron. There's confusion right from the start. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so I bought those, bought a set of books from a lady named Gladys in Texas and, and just started studying them. And I maintained my connection with Chief Little Summer. We had individual councils together. And what happened for me was we sat down together to do a, a, a typical uh, council, I think was something like an hour and a half, but ours went about double that time. And what began to happen is as we were connecting with each other, I, I just saw his body disappear really, and turn into a gold pyramid with an eye and it, just a huge eye looking at me. And then these two guides behind him. And I asked him, is there someone behind you? And he identified the, the names of his guides behind him. And what really sh struck me was that how just normal that was. It mm. wasn't, it wasn't fascinating. Um, it wasn't even exciting. It was just, Oh, I see. This is what's behind all of this. Mm. And now this all makes sense to me. And at the same time, he was talking to me, saying basically that I had designed a kind of childhood curriculum for myself uh, to gain all of these experiences, but I'd, I'd never really been embodied. I'd been witnessing myself the whole time moving through childhood, mm -hmm. and that it would behoove me to find a situation to get myself, find my way to the planet. Mm -hmm. And he suggested teaching. And the Walder School was a natural uh, possibility. Now that was anathema to me. I had no no interest in teaching, and certainly not being with kids in any way, shape, or form. But just decided, well, I'll tuck it under my belt. Mm -hmm. And I ended up moving away from him. And then I went, and I was a produce manager. And the woman who who was had hired me, I'd been there for a year or so. The next day after after this, she came in and she wore a shirt. And I said, "What's what?" what kind of school is that? Because it just said Spring Garden School. And she said, it's a Walder School. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, I see where this is heading. Mm -hmm. So long story short, I ended up in the Walder School at 21. I met Rudolf Steiner's work. And it for me, it, it was a, a perfect confluence with Ra's work. Uh, I saw two teachers who were trying to serve all in a in a very loving way with wisdom. And so I immediately said to myself, I'm, I'll be able to fit Stein, all of Steiner's teachings that work for me into all of what Ra does, because I was a very, and still am a very practical person. If I can't turn something that's an idea into an ideal through practicing and experimenting, 
then it doesn't have any value for me. Mm, yeah, it's just head stuff. Yeah. So I started that long practice, and out of that, some of the the high school students in, in Waldorf in particular came, started asking me deeper questions and, uh, and then more emotional questions and then more spiritual, existential. And I, and I realized I need something more than just uh, a teaching, um, you know, like a BA. I, need, I probably need something more psychological in nature so that I can make sure that I have the chops to, because I'm finding people coming to me and, uh, and really sharing themselves. And that's when I decided to get a, a degree in clinical psychology with a transpersonal f- emphasis. Oh, that's good. Yeah. And I had the, um, one of my chair uh, representatives was the, um, the president of the uh, Somatic Association of the United States. And so, again, all of these things we wove together well for me because my main interest in teaching kids had always, be, always been, how do you bring spirit through the body? Mm-hmm. How do you bring it right through the body? into the toes and into Mother Earth. And that was always my practice with, with all of Steiner's concepts because some of them are so far out that if I can't figure out a way to ground them and practice them, then I, I don't want, even want to talk about them. Yeah, well, that's understandable. So I got into yoga. I became a, a yoga teacher, I became a ropes course instructor. Ropes course meaning like climbing ropes or ropes like the yeah. program for teaching people skills? The latter, a program for teaching people skills, working with groups of people, whether they're executives or, or teens or youth, mm-hmm. or, uh, and teaching them how to work together and how to surpass what they think they can do in terms of their own fear. Right. Really, it's how to overcome fear when you get down to it Yeah, and learn to relate. So I did those things concurrently to, to teaching. Uh, and then after I got, uh, got a doctorate in, in clinical psych, then I just said, well, I think I'll I'll turn my attention to seeing how else I can serve, and I ended up in a in a role of uh, professor and department chair at uh, SBGI, which was a somatic psychology clinical psych program, and that was a dream job. It was absolutely incredible. But within a very short time of me being there, it got bought out, and then I moved on to be uh, eventually president of Rudolf Steiner College, which was training teachers for for Walter Schools, another very mission centered uh, opportunity. Mm-hmm. And then I moved on to be a president of uh, uh, an organization that was working with autistic youth from eighteen to thirty mm-hmm. to get them into uh, into life, into relationships, living on their own, and finding some kind of a a livelihood that they could you know, say yes to, and then helping to start a, a Walder school and leading that. And then I realized I've just been pushing myself so hard and moving so fast, and I'm, I'm, my nervous system is, is fried. You know, my heart is hurting, and I need to slow down, and I need to listen. How old are you at this point? Right now. Oh, so we're right up to date right now. We sure are. Oh wow! Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. That, that's it's quite a journey, though. Yeah, it's been, it's been a lovely journey. Yeah, so that's where you're at. You're in the time to take a break period. Yeah, the pralaya, not just take a break, but to actively listen. Yeah, well, that's to, the process. I, I haven't done that. I, I usually just go from one thing to the next, and I like to I like to work hard. Mm-hmm. I like to work long hours, and now I'm getting older and thinking maybe there's some wisdom in in finding a new way. Yeah, well, I think that's great. Um, you know, for me, the listening part is my soul. And I know you and I have talked about these things. And I think for me, I'm, I've got so much to do all the time with my projects and institute and all the other things that I found that I found many years ago that if I didn't let my soul make decisions, that I just kept burying myself in what thought I thought were good ideas at the time, but later wished I had never said yes to. Yeah. You know, so I finally reached a point where I had to let my soul make those decisions for me, which opened the door to a deep realization that whatever the ego is, it's not a very good driver. (laughs) 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 It creates more problems than good. Yeah. But I think it takes a while for us as human beings to mature. And a lot of people never do get to the level where they realize that the ego is a functional construct but it also has uh, very significant limitations yeah that you know lead to a lot of pain and unfortunately people just medicate and drug it and 
go see psychologists, but they don't really usually get to the core of the realization that it's a, a sort of a necessary spiritual crisis to come to the point where you realize that your attempts at happiness or financial success or whatever it is ultimately end up leading to a lot of pain and and sort of a deeper sense of emptiness in you. Yeah. No, I think Ra would say the same thing about that. He His suggestion is that the lifespan that we currently have is probably 10% of what it had been. Mm -hmm. And that that really prevents the, the capacity to move into kind of a spiritual maturation, that we're in a spiritual childhood for most of life, unless, unless we're really able to awaken. And after awakening, do the do the hard carry steps, mm -hmm. you know, to be, take a disciplined path to w keep walking forward rather than feeling like once you're awakened, you're awakened because that's not on this planet. Yeah. And then, you know, the whole concept of awakening or enlightenment, I, you know, I, from my own studies and my own experiences, it's a, you know, philosophically for me, if God is infinite, then so is the process of enlightenment because God's yeah. constantly exploring its infinite potentials, which is an infinite process. And so I, I think, and we're going to get into this, but I think one of the problems that we have amongst human beings largely due to religious programming is we have the very limited ideas about God. I don't think people are really, I don't think most people are capable of even imagining the expanse, the breadth, the depth of what that really means right mm -hmm. they're so they're 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 they settle for what's passed on to them through books which is almost always you know shankara you know who shankara is mm. the hindu philosopher sage yeah he said no man can understand scripture until he's enlightened and when he's enlightened he doesn't need scripture <laughs> problem is is 99.99999% of the people that are teaching children scripture are far from enlightened <laughs> So what you end up with is a bunch of very confused people doing things that they think God wants them to do or that God tells them to do or whatever. And lo and behold, that God creates lots of pain in your life. And eventually you have an opportunity to go on a real quest for your own experience of God instead of what someone else keeps telling you. So it's a it's a very tricky business, everything to do with God, as we've <laughs> talked about this morning. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm sure you've heard me bragging about Paleo Valley over the years of listening to my podcast, and there's a very good reason for that. Not only do I love the genius of Autumn Smith, a holistic nutritionist, but her products are phenomenally good. My kids love them. I love them, and we all use them every day. My students love them. My clients love them, and they are absolutely top notch. One of my kids' favorite snacks is Paleo Valley's Bone Broth, in chocolate. They love to make their hot chocolate drink themselves simply by whisking up collagen-rich protein powder in a mug of hot water. And I'm happy to let them indulge as I know it is packed full of great nutrition for them in the disguise of a sweet treat. Even us big kids love our sweet treats. And isn't it great when we can enjoy something that not only tastes great, but is truly great for us? Paleo Valley's 100% Grass-fed bone broth protein is the only of its kind made from truly grass-fed cows raised on pesticide-free grass pastures. It's made from bones, not hides, slowly simmered to extract the proteins and nutrients. Gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and dairy-free, the chocolate mix includes organic coconut milk powder, organic cacao bean, organic monk fruit that makes a sweet, creamy, delicious drink that my kids, family, and friends just can't get enough of. You can also add to smoothies, use it in baking, or mix it with your coffee for a healthy mocha treat. Paleo Valley's bone broth protein is also available in vanilla and unflavored. To try Paleo Valley's excellent bone broth protein and save 15% on your purchase, go to paleovalley.com forward slash lowercase c-h-e-k 15. No promo is required. That's P-A-L-E-O. V A L L E Y dot com forward slash C H E K 15 to get your 15% discount as a living 4D listener. No promo code is required. And I promise you, not only will you love this stuff, your kids will love it. You can giggle and laugh because they think they're getting a sweet dessert right before bed, but they will love it and sleep great. And boy, do we parents love it when our kids sleep great. Enjoy Paleo Valley's amazing products. 
because you're the only person that I've ever met that has a deep knowledge of Steiner and Raw simultaneously, usually there's somebody that's very skilled on Raw but doesn't know much about Steiner or a lot of Steiner people that I've met that are quite evolved in Steiner's teachings don't really know much of anything about Raw or they might have heard of Raw but they don't really know much of what the teachings are. So to have you be able to give us this juxtaposition of these two viewpoints where there's harmony and differences is is quite a blessing, which is why I was so excited to talk to you on the podcast about this. So I thought we'd start with the big question first. What is God from Ra's perspective and what mm. is God from Steiner's perspective? Mm. Yeah. Or is there even a God? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a that's a great question. That's a that's I guess that's about as deep as it gets. <laughs> Uh, why not start? Why not start with, with the, the big hitter? Let's go. You know, we're, while we're fresh, let's get, right. get the shovels out and start digging. Yeah, pitch me a gymnastic ball to hit with a bat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, why not? I have both for you. <laughs> All right. I think for for Ra, the the name that he would probably use for for God would be one infinite creator. With and you just mentioned infinity that there. There, in in a way, there isn't a beginning and there isn't an end. And for some people, that's an unsatisfactory answer, and I understand that. For me, it's a it's a delightful answer. Me too. You, the, you know, the problem with a god that has a beginning and an end is you always have to ask, well, what created that? A god, you know, in, in my definition, God is that for which there is no other. In other words, if you can get to the point where there's still something that could possibly create God, you haven't found God. You've just got an idea or a construct or yeah. some, you know, illusion. And uh, so when when I use the definition of God as that for which there is no other, it means there is there is nowhere to go. You've hit the bottom. That's source. That's where the where the water of life is coming from. And everything else is just some sort of an expression of that. Yeah, it's downstream. And I wrote about this in my Spirit Gym series, and I, I said, you know, if you understand, even in the Bible where it describes God as omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, those words omni mean all, which is absolute, which is even beyond infinite, because you can have multiple infinities at one time. You can have infinite knowledge, but you may not have infinite strength. You can have an infinite number of points on the head of a pin, but you can also have infinite number of points in a line. You know, if you look into Cantor's math on infinity, he shows you all sorts of ways that infinity can be worked with. But the point I'm making is when you look at omni words in the Bible as one reference, those are absolute words. They're 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 not even infinite. They're omni. Yeah. And so because most people don't really understand what those words actually mean, like they, they just kind of rattle them off like they use the word God and not really realize what they're saying, that the concept of an infinite God is very hard for people to really wrap their human mind around. Because if God is that for which no, there is no other, it means God has infinite power, infinite amounts of information, infinite wisdom, infinite information and infinite processing speed. So if you think of what has infinite creativity, infinite power, infinite wisdom, infinite knowledge, infinite no, infinite information, infinite processing speed, and say, okay, what could you create with that? I'm looking at it. Well, so am I. Yeah. And so is the whole universe. But the problem is, is we're just looking at the physical aspects of it, right? And And this is, you know, why concepts like multiverse, omniverse, many worlds interpretation, Everett's many, many worlds interpretation, where there's something like 10 to the 500 possibilities with every choice that we make, all can be being actuated at once. Yeah. I mean, I've studied 37 theories of everything, and interestingly, none of them agree with each other. So you see, from my perspective, that God can actually be doing all of that at the same time, and you can be a human and say, oh, that's not possible, that's not true, but not realize, oh, yes, it is possible, and that everything's possible. And, you know, Aubrey Hepburn has a beautiful quote, which from an actress, you know, is a hot-looking babe. It's quite deep, but it's very simple. She says, nothing is impossible. The word itself says, I'm possible. And so, 
if you think of God as infinite, then you could say nothing is impossible. And what does it say in the Bible? I am that I am. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I am that I am can also be I am infinite and that I am. And that means everything's possible. So I think it, it's a. Uh, I think it's time for human beings to release the shackles of preconceived ideas of God and and spend some time doing some deep dreaming. And I think this is you know what vision quests are for. I think that's what meditations for. Mm -hmm. I think you know my experience as a remote viewer is that <laughs> there's a lot more going on here than the conscious mind can wrap its head around. You uh -huh. know, and then um, I think also that there's the skillful use of plant medicines because I've had profound, deep God experiences. I've had them through Tai Chi, I've had them through meditation, but I've also had many through plant medicine experiences, you, you know, very significant journeys, very deep journeys where mm -hmm. it, it literally ultra, utter, utterly blows your mind. Yeah. I mean, you're completely mind blown. And so when you're free of the limitation of mind, but you're still there enough to perceive, it's as though you go into a parallel process of perception yourself, which you can't really do with a mind because the yeah. mind's always cutting everything. Yeah. So the alchemist called the mind the logos cutter, logo meaning logos meaning divine plan. Mm. So we have to cut it into pieces so we can talk about it. Right. 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 But when you go deep enough to literally blow your mind, yet you remain conscious, then you can find yourself in many dimensions, experiencing many realities, even at once. I've yeah. experienced myself on multiple planes all at the same time, going, How is this possible? I've even I, I I've even had experiences where I'm I have a family and children in another dimension in another body, living a total lifetime while I'm also simultaneously alive here. Now, these are things that most people don't have a slot for in their mailroom. You know? <laughs> right. And, you know, a lot of people would say people like me are crazy, but I'd say, look, perception is as real as it gets, right? If you're having mm -hmm. an experience, you're having an experience. Mm -hmm. And I've had many, many experiences that were more real than this experience in my body right here, breathing and talking to you. And I've come back into this experience and it felt like this was the sleepy, dreamy experience. And so, I mean, I could go off on a, a thousand of these experiences because they're so profound and I've found them to be so enriching that it was important for me to continue to do my own personal research so that I don't just believe shit that people say right. and, and trust that that's the truth because so far that hasn't worked out well for anybody in the world. No, it Look, doesn't. here we are. Yeah. We're a, we're a world full of believers. <laughs> yeah. And how's that worked and, out? And the beliefs are a little, a little challenging right now. And most of those <laughs> beliefs are programmed by people that want to control you yeah. for their own benefits. So, so if you're, if I hear you right, Ra would say that there's one infinite creator, mm -hmm. and that is the source of everything. Is that in, correct in Ra's perspective? That's certainly, he's the source of everything, and, and he would, certainly the, the being that is Ra, the, the 6.5 billion or, or million uh, mind-body complexes, which he calls basically. Which we would call a soul. Which we would call a soul. Mm -hmm. Loved, trusted, and understood one another to where spoken language is no longer necessary. And they, they would be these individuals you're talking about that can be in multiverses, that can mm. experience these different situations and in real time communicate that experience to the rest of the individuals in what may be called a monad or a social memory complex. Mm -hmm. So that's the creator knowing the creator. And mm -hmm. what does that look like at, at our level? At our level, that means when I said, when I, I wasn't being flip, when I said you, that we actually are able to look at the other and see the creator all, at all times, that yes. we can look in the mirror and we can see the creator yeah. and that we can then become the creator mm -hmm. at whatever level. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean all of a sudden we're creating universes. We're certain, I, I don't know anybody who's close to the level of creating universes. No, we, we have to learn. Yeah. I mean, first we need to start participating active imaginationally with archetype beings who mm -hmm. are constantly creating and recreating, you know, in this kind of morphic resonance field, mm -hmm. beings and things and even ideas. Ra would call uh, thoughts even part of what things are. He calls thoughts forms mm -hmm. because it's the reflection of what he would call the original thought. And what he asks us to think about is, have you had one original thought today? 
have you had a thought that really is aligned with the creator? Or as you just said, are we looking at beliefs? Are we downstream parroting what it is rather than having our own experience and generating, having a, a self-generated experience of true thinking? I've had several original thoughts today. Yeah? I can prove it to you. Yeah? I had to figure out how to put 14 rocks together, <laughs> each of which has its own unique shape, form, and personality and presence. And I had to dialogue with them about how they wanted to engage these relationships. Mm -hmm. And none of those 14 rocks have ever held hands in my presence before. <laughs> and if I didn't listen to them, I might not be here having this conversation <laughs> with you. And you were there watching it. So you know exactly what I mean. That's right. That's right. But I mean that. Like, yes. Like that's, that's an original thought. Mm -hmm. I'm not listening to anybody else's ideas. There's no handbook on how to do this. This is not Lego blocks or building blocks. This is, you know, novel experiences. And that's one of the reasons I do that kind. Of, that's why I paint, for example. I empty myself and just let soul work through me and paint something completely and utterly original that comes from nowhere. It's not a copy of anything. I often don't even know what I'm painting until I stand back and go, holy shit, how'd that happen? Yeah. And I think that's a, a really important point because most people's thinking is really just a form of artificial intelligence. It's just programs networking with programs that are no different than a laptop computer versus what I would call natural intelligence or the intelligence of the soul which would mean to do what we were just talking about, do original things. I think people have lost touch with originality and authenticity yeah. and spontaneity, which is all a mode of saying creativity. Yeah, and I think that's where Steiner would go with the, with the question of what is God. He, he certainly would place God, he, he's a, he comes out of a mode of... Uh, that the important thing for the human being is to be able to come from 12 different viewpoints in order to be whole and balanced. And Ra has a very biased perception toward the necessity for being balanced as well. They just look, they look different. But, but Steiner's is a 12-fold is a picture that is constellational uh, in each individual, say, in a particular meeting room. It can be essential or at least very helpful if at least one of them is carrying strongly a stream from one of those. And they, they run all the way from spiritualist to idealist to materialist to realist mm -hmm. and, and all points in between. And each one of them holds an experience of something that, that is, they're passionate about. Mm -hmm. And they have a real sense that this is necessary to bring to the world. And to have any decision being made, to have all 12 of those viewpoints, uh, is, is the ideal in Steiner's perception to, to have a decision have the most carrying capacity, mm -hmm. the most resolve, yeah. resolve being the seventh level of will in Steiner's sort of picture of things. And so artistic work is a strong way to get there because you become co-creator, unless you're copying somebody else's right. work. And his picture in particular uh, of individuals who compose music is those are the individuals who are working directly with archetypal beings, with, harmon with the harmony of the spheres, which is not something that we hear in the normal kind of hearing. It's an inner sort of hearing. And you and I just talked about this earlier, your progression of being able to talk to your soul. It took a yes and no mm. with a feeling of up or down. Mm -hmm. So there was a somatic resonance as a, yeah. as a st simple first step. And then you had the step of, of sort of fleeting images or still images coming. Mm -hmm. And then more of a montage, mm -hmm. almost like a movie. Mm -hmm. And then actually being able to, to hear and then to speak and communicate. So this is the same... What you described to me is your experience is the same progression that Steiner takes us through. Yeah, that's interesting because I didn't do it with any guidance from any- I didn't have the sense that you did. Source. It was just like a plant grows and matures. Mm -hmm. uh, as I got to the point where I realized there was just too many things I couldn't get clarity on because there wasn't a way to answer them with a yes or a no, I had to start getting stiller inside and not- I couldn't just rely on a, a yes, no, like do this, do that kind of mommy, daddy kind of coaching. I had to, fortunately, I'm quite a visual person and, and all my Tai Chi opened up my clairvoyance very, very strongly. So I can, I have inner seeing. So my soul took advantage of that and began to, and it started a long time ago when I was working with patients that were really complicated. And so mm -hmm. I would just ask my soul to connect me to their soul because I don't know what to do. This person's got so many things wrong. I could, I could go in almost any direction and, mm -hmm. and probably help them. But I was really looking for what is the, 
the common denominator that if I take this one domino out, the house of cards will fall down and their health will accelerate. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so I would go into meditation while I was working on them. Often I would have them face down. I would just touch their body to connect strongly to their field. I would ask my soul to connect me to their soul. And I would say, what is it? You know, obviously I have a soul contract with you. Here I am. What would, what would you like me to do? And I would start getting images maybe oftentimes of things like child sexual abuse or child trauma or uh, any number of things that have happened in their life because their soul would be sh showing me where the actual etiology of the crisis started from. Yeah. And then guide me like that and also tell me what questions to ask them to help them become conscious because oftentimes they're not even conscious of where their cancer is coming from or where their digestive troubles are coming from or their, you know, their, their chronic throat pain or whatever it might be. And so then through a variety of other practices and also encountering a lot of people, a lot of people, deceased family members would would show up when I was doing healing work with people and want to give me messages. And so I had to start really emptying myself and listening to them with almost like a shamanic listening, a second listening, not, not my physical ears, but, but clairaudience. And so then they would start talking to me. So I learned how to really go even more calm in my listening space so that I could hear these things. Because sometimes when you're talking to people on the other side, it's almost like they're talking to you from the moon. It's quite strange. But then that even evolved to where I would be able to just pick up information from them through telepathy. They would just look at me in the eyes and, 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 it, and it would come to me. Sometimes I would see like streams of light coming at me and all of a sudden the information would be in my mind. And then I would say, oh, did you just tell me this? And so as that was happening, I was also simultaneously using that with my soul. And so as, as all this grew over the span of, you know, pro probably over 15 years progressively to get to where I've reached to now, that was just the natural unfolding of it. And then, of course, coupled with a lot of study and, and growing myself and, and, you know, many other practices. But there was one thing, oh, while you were talking about the 12, I've studied many different religious and philosophical systems and spiritual development concepts. And one of the things that's popped up uh, on a number of occasions is the belief, for example, in, in theosophy, they have discussions of this, that we reincarnate through each of the 12 signs of the zodiac until we understand life from that perspective. In tarot, we go through all the 22 major arcana and you know, I'm a 22 in tarot, which suggests that I've already lived through all of these arcana. And now I'm coming back as a teacher because I'm able to see beyond the limitations of any of those mm -hmm. major archetypes. And then there's other philosophies. I think Blavatsky is one of them. I think Dwal Kool, who is apparently the reincarnation of, of Confucius, if I remember right, says that we also will reincarnate through each of the world's major religions. So while we're going through zodiac incarnations, we're also going through religious incarnations for the exact purpose of seeing and perceiving and understanding life and God and relationships through these different perspectives. Yeah, that's that's interesting. The The process of reincarnation through karma is certainly something that, that Ra and Steiner agree on. Where they, where they don't agree is Steiner's picture is that every millennium you incarnate once in a male body and then once in a female body. And that's who, Ra or Steiner? That's, that's Steiner. Whereas Ra says that if there is one infinite creator, then there are infinite possibilities. Mm -hmm. So in his estimation, any system breaks down. In, mm -hmm. in other words, there are going to be exceptions and there may be infinite exceptions to mm -hmm. any rule. And so you may incarnate and then reincarnate again immediately. But you may incarnate and then not reincarnate for many, many thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And you may not change sexes when you do so. And so he, Ra allows for a kind of infinite variation that I, I have to say, having that quality of infinite variety makes sense to me if you're one infinite creator. It makes sense. I think so too. The um, other codified, sort of rigidified, actually looks a little. It looks a little too pedantic, mm -hmm. a little too controlling. Mm -hmm. 
it's interesting because the, the the primary difference between the the being of Ra and the being of Steiner is that Steiner walked around in a, in a male human body and had these insights, and Ra walked around without it. So Ra's hampering. Uh, was that he really had no idea what he was getting into when he came around to help. And mm-hmm. I'm saying he sort of, it's a, it's a, it's a they or it's a, it, it's a social memory complex. A mix of he and she. Yeah. But heading toward the one infinite creator because there is an octave of densities, which we can, which we can talk about. In six density, there is this kind of unity of all of these beings. So Ra as one saying we am Ra sounds kind of weird for our mm, language. Right. But they don't use language they use telepathy so it's mm-hmm. it's less of an issue but his his or their ability to come which which they did uh, in the egyptian time which is why they were revered as a god rather than a brother or a friend mm-hmm. or a teacher which is really what they came to be is to help you know when those teachings were perverted they were incredibly naive about that they had no thought because of their own evolution elsewhere, in this case on Venus, which was very harmonious. And the ways that they learned to love one another were subtle and exquisite compared to the way the, the ways that we are attempting to, <laughs> to love yes. each other here. And so th- they ended up extricating themselves karmically in our path. And they, you know, I, I, I sort of joked with you earlier that they probably got back into their, their light bodies, headed out of here, and one looked at the other and said, that didn't go very well, did it? <laughs> because the Egyptians took their their possibility for healing and balancing not just one another as human beings in pyramids, but had balancing pyramids set equidistantly on the planet to help balance the the Mother Earth herself. And those things were co opted, corrupted, and used yeah. for power for by the elite Pharaoh class. Yeah, probably still are. And th- and so in a certain way, then Ra has this need for restitution. And because Ra lives in time space rather than space time. Yes, explain that because that's confusing for a lot of people. Well, space time is, is when you have a body. Yeah, and right. And time here. space is when you don't. Yeah. And I, I say physical body because bodies are still had in time space dimensions up to, up to the octave when yeah. a, a recycling occurs to the first density of a new creation. I'd like to add something to that, though, because I sure. think I think that we can be in space time, but we can also be in time space. For Absol- example, absolutely. When I'm doing astral travel, I'm sitting in my chair, but I could actually have an experience of an entire lifetime. When you're sleeping every night, you're in time space. Yes. At so, least your astral and your ego body are. Yeah. The etheric and physical are are resting in bed. But when I'm here talking to you, I can see the clock ticking. I know how many minutes we've been talking. So here we're, we're, we're really in space-time, where time is based on relationships of movement. Sun moving around, Earth moving around, everything. You, you can't have time in, in our dimension without relationship. Right. Right? That's why it's a construct. But when you're in time space, mm-hmm. then the relationship nature completely changes because we're not dealing with physical bodies. Right. We're dealing with mental bodies. Mm-hmm. And those change as fast as your mind changes. Right. Right. That's one of the things you learn in astral work is and you know, one of the like a lot of people say, Can you teach me remote viewing? Can you teach me how to work in the astral dimension? And I say, Well, when you can learn to hold your mind still enough, because otherwise it's gonna be like somebody that's got, you know, let's say a, a lot of speed in them is holding on to the remote control of your television and you're going to get flash from screen to screen to screen to screen. And you're going to be, you know, you're going to wonder, how, well, how am I supposed to get anything out of this? I'm not realizing it's your mind jumping around. And so that's one of the, the key things. But I think the only point I was trying to drive at there is just that we are able to move back and forth between those. And I mean, a lot of people driving their car can't even remember if the light was green when they went through that last intersection because they were in time space having a dream while they were driving a car in space time. And, you know, that can be dangerous. And that's why drugs and driving are dangerous. Not so good. And drugs and power tools are dangerous. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Happy holidays. You know, the holidays are typically a time when we overeat or eat foods that we don't normally indulge in. And this can cause digestive upsets, bloating, skin eruptions, bags under your eyes, congestion, immune stress, brain fog, joints, aches and pains, and overall stress on our digestive system. It's all about having a good time, but I also like to enjoy holidays without having to endure the collateral damage we so often experience. 
Bioptimizers Masszymes are not only very powerful digestive aids made with the most advanced enzyme technology in the world today, they can effectively break down and aid metabolism of foods that our mind loves, but our body may not love so much. Support your digestion this holiday with Bioptimizers Masszymes and support your wallet with a special discount for Living 4D listeners. Go to Masszymes. Dot com that's m a s s z y m e s dot com forward slash paul ten lowercase paul ten and use the promo code lowercase paul ten to save ten percent on a bottle of masszymes purchase more than one bottle or subscribe to monthly auto ship and save even more once again to get your masszymes go to masszymes.com forward slash paul ten with the code Paul 10. With Masszymes, you can have fun on your holidays and beyond and know that you're supporting your body too. Enjoy. Ron and Steiner have a concordance on the importance of not only the dream state, and when we say dream state, it could be whether you're sleeping, so a third of our lives at night, or the daydream state, that these things are essential. And the necessity to move into time space Steiner has many techniques for it. One of them is called the Rookshaw, right before you go to sleep. Mm -hmm. You think backwards through your day. Mm -hmm. And everybody always wonders, why why are we doing this? Well, it's not just uh, some kind of menial exercise, but you're looking for significant signposts that that could be karmic in origin, but you're also reversing the time stream Mm -hmm. in your thought before you move into sleep. And then when you're able to do that, you've already taken consciously a process that would have had to take place unconsciously in sleep. So your teachers can then come to you earlier because you're now prepared to be sitting with Rudolf Steiner or whoever it is to gain the teaching that you need to get for the, for the next day's work. And the goal for Steiner is what he would call continuity of consciousness, that there's a guardian of the gate, there's a hypnopomp and a, and a hypnagogue at both their guardians of the gates of sleep. Why don't you describe those terms for people listening? I just did. They're just they're guardians. Okay. I'll just do it really simply. You want more? Well, I think my understanding of, of hyp- hypnagogic is you're in two states simultaneously, sleeping and waking. You're at the threshold. Yeah. Yes. And so the goal is to move into and across the threshold consciously mm-hmm. in both directions. And that's continuity of consciousness. And so for Ra, the same is the case. You're looking to move what in in a native tradition would, would be from relative awareness to absolute awareness in the dream time. Mm. And to the extent that you're able to do that in that tradition, you you move into becoming a power dreamer. And that gives you access to the time-space realm at will. And many individuals who are incredibly devout healers are able to move from that time-space realm where healing can take place. So that's one of the big differences is when we're embodied here, we have a strong feeling of separation. You and I had spoken a little earlier, you said something like the soul has to, has to paint, right, with yeah. a brush. And then once the paint is there, we're enamored of the paint and we all of a sudden think, oh, I can see a body. That's, mm. oh, that's my body. Here I am. Oh, and that's all I've got. Well, I can think, but I'm thinking in my body. I can mm. feel, I'm feeling in my body. And, mm-hmm. and then sort of the, the gig's up and we, we, we go about wandering or about the place for incarnations until we have some sort of experience and we realize there's something more here. And what is this more? And then if we start to investigate it, and I, this is where I think it's so challenging in today's scientific paradigm, is the individual can determine for himself or herself what the experience is that occurs, the interpretation of the experience, and the next steps. They don't need a scientific community to agree mm-hmm. with them. The challenge of the scientific community is that kind of bias and pressure causes this picture of, well, there aren't any UFOs. Who the hell can say that? And on, and on what basis would yeah. you even, as a scientist, make a ludicrous statement that there aren't any or there are any such and such unless you've had a direct experience yeah. that for all eternity, there's no such thing as an ET? Rather, what Steiner would suggest, and this comes from Goethe, is that we hold an open scientific attitude yeah. toward everything yes. to say, I've never seen an ET. All the evidence I've heard about ETs makes no uh, logical sense to me, and I'm 100% open, 100% to the possibility that an ET could stand before me, and I would change my position based on that experience. That's the scientific paradigm that I would like to see us move toward. 
Well, I think the, the, the scientific paradigm you're talking about that says things like there's no such thing as ETs is people that are trapped in space-time because everything that's real to them can be weighed or measured. And to be weighed or measured, you have to have something that fills space in three dimensions. It has weight, mass, <laughs> etc. And if you're measuring it, you're already in time where you can't do the measurement. Right? And what Ra clearly said is, okay, we realized we screwed up here with the Egyptians. We're not coming back physically anymore. The way that we will help is through dreams, mm -hmm. through intuitions in the daytime, through images that pop into your head, through the, he didn't say this, but through the lines of songs, mm -hmm. something that keeps coming. And you take the time to say, there, something is asking for a conversation with me. Mm -hmm. And as Maurice Merleau-Ponty said, everything is relationship. Yes. It's all. Relationship is essence. Yeah. Well, that's, love is the basis of relationship. And again, there's a concordance between Ra and Steiner. Steiner wrote, writes about love and its meaning in the world. Ra talks about the harvest, which we, which we could talk about. We'll get there when we talk about yeah. souls, yeah. Is, is focused on uh, either love of self to a, uh, to a high degree, 95% of all actions are involve purity of a, of a love of self or uh, service to all. And sometimes it's called service to others. But I find that when I look around, people are leaving themselves out of the equation. And that's, that's martyrdom, mm -hmm. which I find unhelpful. And yeah, and unless, unless you're ready for it, which in some of my studies, I think Dwal Cool says that things like martyrdom are, are a late stage for human evolution, meaning that when a soul has reached the point where it's ready to let go of the physical body and no longer be reincarnated here, that it often will give itself up completely in martyrdom or a total sacrifice or yeah. knowing that whatever it's about to do is going to get it killed right? and just consciously doing it because it's part of its own completion to put the body on the altar and let go of it, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. Ra Ra's picture in general is that unicellular organisms, microorganisms, basically were placed on the planet for that purpose because otherwise we'd continue to, to just live forever. And there needs to be some kind of a method that uh, higher beings constructing human beings approve of that say, how can we do this? How can we make this work? And mm -hmm. certainly those kinds of uh, illnesses uh, are what Ra's picture of the best, the best way to go out. But the, I think the, the martyr, and those are, those are, I think are more outliers, You're, but point taken, the individuals like, like Gandhi, uh, like Martin Luther King, like Christ, mm -hmm. there is, uh, there's something on the planet that I think would be called the frying pan method. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Which is to say, Everyone stops and takes a look, and and not just from this world, but from the time space worlds. When those events happen, where there's an individual who's moved toward that level of of ethical individualism, that's what Steiner would call it, to such an extent that they're removed in a certain way, and they're removed in a way that causes a lot of a lot of grief for for many many thousands of people. That there there's a possibility for awakening there. And the challenge becomes if we continue to focus on the death rather than the life, and that's that that's the challenge. And so that much that's we we like to rubberneck. We like to spiritually rubberneck. So we look at the gore and say, "How did he die?" And let's look at the wound and how big was it and how mm. much blood was there, and who was groaning and gnashing teeth. But we don't say to ourselves, not necessarily, unless we get quiet. Okay, let's reflect on all that happened that led up to this place and recognize that this was just a signpost for us to pay attention to all of those things mm -hmm. and how do we, we can then reflect those things back to what is it that I can now do in the world based on how I've been inspired by this individual. Yes. I just wanted to throw in something that's a little bit of funny part of my biography, a kismet, or Jung would call it synchronicity. I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, and I was in high school in ninth to 12th grade, wow, up the street, completely unbeknownst to me, and I would have had no capacity to, to hear it at that point because I was in quite a bit of trauma. Ra was coming through to, to Jim and Carla. That's and, crazy. And yeah, I remember and you Don. did tell me that. Yeah. That blows my mind. Yeah. So it's just, it's absolutely incredible. I was going to Atherton High School and Wagner Middle School, and this, this this was happening right in proximity. It's wild. Yeah, maybe you got your energy field picked it up. Uh, you know, there's there is something about about Louisville that, uh, and I'm very sensitive to to sort of land and terroir and, mm -hmm. and the energy of different spaces. And um, yeah, there's something really special about that area. I think that's where my buddy Nathan Riley lives right now. 
Oh, yeah? He's our family OBGYN. Oh, yeah. Okay. He's a cool cat, very deep. You'd love him. I'll have to connect you to him. Yeah. He's got a great podcast, too. Okay. So my next question, which you can give a, a kind of a whatever answer you want, having discussed God, what is the function of life and the universe? The function of life and the universe? Well, if there's, first, a, if there's a different perspective between Raw and Steiner, I'd like to hear that. Yeah. Both of them certainly deal in, in levels, which they would call different things, whether it's dimensions or densities or, or hierarchies or levels or planes. Octaves. Octaves, depend, depending on what, what you're reading and, and what the sort of situation is that they're talking about. Steiner's very hierarchical in his thinking. That's what spiritism, the definition of it is, is, is I believe in very nuanced levels of beings. Ra would take that to the infinite level. Mm -hmm. in terms of, and, and so I would say they both believe or experience, I don't think believe is correct, but they talk from experience. Their experience is that the function of existence is a hier hierarchical progression from lower, but not to, to pejorative. To, that's not pejoratively lower. Right. It's just a different form of yeah, experience. I mean, Mother Earth is certainly not lower in any kind of judgment sense. She is uh, incredibly brilliant, but she's she would be the the lowest of the levels of consciousness. Uh, and so for Ra, it wouldn't be unusual that I would have been a rock for ten thousand years. Mm -hmm. Steiner, in contrast, doesn't deal in that sort of you were a plant or you were a rock or you were an animal. Mm -hmm. I would say the native. Uh, Traditions are much more in alignment with Ra in that a flexibility that you could even be a cloud. Mm -hmm. You could be a mountain. There is no limit to what you could be. And that has actually more resonance for me than, again, a sort of codified consciousness could not be placed inside a rock. Because for Ra, that is not the case. Not the case from my, my own experience. Not from my own experience either. Yeah. I ex I've experienced being a rock mm. for 10,000 years. Mm. Interesting, yeah. I've experienced... That was the last time I took a break, by the way. Yeah, well, it's a good break. <laughs> you can literally hang out in space. My experience is that each form has consciousness unique to the form itself, mm -hmm. and that all forms are somehow interrelated to all other forms. Like, what is a flower? It couldn't be here without rocks. Yeah. Rocks make soil. Yeah. Soil anchors the flower into the negative polarity, and the water is the negative polarity, but the sunlight's the positive polarity. So there you have an electromagnetic current and, and all plants and trees grow along the flow of electric current and the magnetic current wraps itself around the earth. So you see that there's your Christian cross right there. You can, you can see the vertical is the electric, the horizontal is the magnetic. That's one way to look at it. There's many ways to look at it. And I, I've studied Steiner's teachings on the cross, so I know he breaks it down. You know, Steiner says the plant and mineral and plant kingdom is the vertical beam to the up to the horizontal the horizontal beam represents the animal spine and then the vertical beam above the horizontal beam represents the human head and human consciousness so that's one of the models Steiner uses but without a long discussion of the cross because there's many models of the cross um the my only point is and you know if you study Gebser's model of consciousness which is the archaic which is the mineral kingdom and the mm -hmm. kind of like the core foundation of the earth and the magic kingdom is living in concert with nature as nature. Then the mythic kingdom is when we start speaking and using the spoken word and stories to describe what we think's going on. Then from the mythic comes the mental, which is what we're very deeply and dangerously caught in now, which then becomes the integral where all these forms of consciousness come into our consciousness at once. And he describes it as diaphanous or see-through, where many timelines are converge, and it moves towards a singularity experience. Right, and Steiner would would concord with with Gebser in that way. In that, what happens is, in in participating with for the format you said you were visual earlier, in the formation of of something visual, in expanding something two dimensionally visually into a three D. Steiner would, would have a picture that if you're visualizing something, that you're having that as a mental experience. If you add the imaginal to it, which usually means to add the artistic, which mm -hmm. is why we do art in Walter schools with, with young entities, yeah. is you're now adding the heart. And the intelligence, he calls this the uh, Gemütlichkeit, 
And this is the, the wisdom of the heart as intelligence rather than intellect. And he concords, uh, Steiner concords with Ra in that we don't want to be intellecting. He has an intellectual soul as a middle phase for a soul phase, but uh, Steiner, but that moves into a consciousness soul. Consciousness combines the sentient soul, which is the first of the... Biological soul. Well, well, his picture is from age 28 down to 21. There's a sentient soul experience that the human being has. They all take place within the spiritual sun sphere. And we have to distinguish between a kind of spiritual sun and a physical sun. All of the, the zodiacs and planets would be the same. And that's, again, I think that's another discussion. But during age 21 to 42 is when soul development takes place because the ego comes in for Steiner at age 21, or the I being, mm -hmm. uh, depending on how you translate it. And so those three soul developments progress through to this consciousness soul, which weaves together the sentient and the intellectual, which means the, the love and the light or the uh, uh, wisdom. And that equals intelligence. And this is why Ra uses the term, he doesn't use intellectual infinity, you know. Mm. He doesn't use intellectual energy. So he uses infinite energy, yes. which is love. Mm. That's the, they're, they're synonymous. Right, okay, good. And so infinite intelligence is synonymous with wisdom, is synonymous with actually being the co-creator or the creator. And when you weave those two things together, then you have the kind of singularity that Oppenheimer was looking for. And it's the resolver of paradoxes. It dissolves the paradoxes. It doesn't say the paradoxes don't exist, but it's, it's capable of being uh, peripheral and seeing the, the forest for the trees. And both Steiner and Ra give that picture that, that these things are able to be parsed out. And in the same moment, as you said, you could be in two different body experiences and, yes. and you could be an infinite, that these things can occur and that you can do it consciously. You can do it with or without entheogens. You can do it with or without fasting. We talked about this earlier mm -hmm. because I was saying we, I went into a three-day dark experience. I fasted, didn't have any water. And uh, you said, yeah, that's not for me right now. And I said, yeah, because you don't need it because yeah. you're in a particular subtle place of what a, a, I, I want to just share a, a book, the Buddha in Red Face that I offered to you mm -hmm. and just add a third perspective because it, it concords well with both Ra and Steiner that the absolute dream time state of power dreamers gives you this capacity to be, once you have reached what Ra would call the state of being unswayed. The unswayed state is what happens eventually when catalyst comes, which normally would create trauma, we're able to read and see the catalyst and be completely spacious about it, completely mm -hmm. neutral. And this for Ra is the, when this happens, through experience, and the experience is not to be avoided. So Oscar Wilde said the only way to resist a temptation is to yield to it. Right. So you let yourself fully experience what I would say the unstudied, spontaneous, honest response to catalyst. And you do that until catalyst leaves you in a state of being unswayed. It's the same for the ideal of the power dreamer, that you're able to assume responsibility for first your tribe, and then your nation, and then even humanity. You can take that upon you as perhaps Christian Rosenkreutz, or some say Steiner took on that responsibility, or some would say Buddha, to say, I will take the karma of my own beings upon me, which it means all of us. Mm -hmm. There's an understanding and an experience that we're all one. How would, how, how would you not want to take that on? Because this would be like leaving your arm behind right. if you didn't do that. Mm -hmm. So I just want to share that there, there are these uh, flowing together in, in absolute dream time experiences of the native practice that we dream into each other. And this is something that I brought to, well, actually, uh, you have an individual who you did a podcast with, Jared. I taught his child in the Walder School. Oh, uh -huh, great. And I had to leave that, that small, you know, those, those children at a certain point, and there was a, a great sadness. And so what I said to them is, it's quite possible for us to meet in the dream time, yes. to meet in sleep if you like. And then we started doing it together. Right. And so there's a, there again is a great motivation because there's a loss of a teacher from a group of children that's a mutual sadness. And that sadness creates an impetus to how is it that we can connect together mm -hmm. in the dream time. And See, I do that through soul. What's that mean? Can you tell me? Well, what I say is uh, like if I want to meet you when you're gone, like when you leave today, mm -hmm. I just ask my soul, please connect me to Edmund's soul. Exactly. So I can have a conversation with him. And it's very interesting because I will talk to people's souls about things. Yeah. And then they will say things like, 
I had a dream and you came to me and talked to me, or they will say, yeah. um, you were all of a sudden in my mind yesterday and I started having thoughts about such and such and it's what I'm talking to them about. Yeah. So it's, it's uh, I think because the soul isn't time bound, I think you're kind of, there's a, a juxtaposition of the dream world there. Uh, it, de- it just depends on how one contextualizes the word dreaming. Yes. You know, I think dreaming is time space oriented, not space time oriented. And so they seem to intersect. If you think of the vertical and the horizontal beam, the dream world is right where the two intersect for me. And the vertical dimension would be David Bohm's implicate domain, mm-hmm. and the horizontal beam is the explicate domain. But the implicate domain is the creative intelligence or the entelechy behind the explicate domain. Mm-hmm. It's the spirit that manifests in form, yeah. right? So it's informing and it's information. So spirit is information. Yes. And Steiner would concord with that again. His whole conception of the ether and and working with the etheric body is that is the body that informs, just mm-hmm. as Bohm had said, you know, probably 50 years later. And that's happening constantly. And the the sort of waves that the the dream time can travel on from your soul heading over to mine is on these waves. Mm-hmm. And these waves are always from the periphery to the point. And so from Steiner's perception, our limbs, for example, are limb stumps. This is not a limb. Our limb, and this again concords with Ra, is infinite. Mm-hmm. And it arrives from the infinite periphery at every moment. And we simply slip ourselves like an envelope into that stream in order for the arms to go up. And if you're truly able to do that, you can hold your arms here for an hour and have no physical effort. And in fact, that's the goal, is to live in that levity, that lightness sphere, in order to have just a sense of uprightness when it's needed, kind of like you said, when your soul says yes to something, mm-hmm. there's a lift. Mm-hmm. And when there's a no, there's a gravity, gravity to it. Gravity to it, yeah. And, and we want and need both of those things. Yeah. Two things. One, I'll loop back to here in a second, but when, I'm, when I was doing Tai Chi daily, sometimes twice a day, I often got to the point where I would have so much life force energy in me or prana that it would feel as though my limbs were beginning to float and and everything was lightening. And I I often knew, you know, I would do Tai Chi until I had the experience of my life force energy shooting out of the crown chakra. So it was like a cup runneth over. And that's how I knew, for example, when I was traveling and moving around on airplanes all the time, I would just say to my soul, you know, let me know when we're balanced for the day so I can handle the load of being moving all the time. And I would just do Tai Chi till it, I felt I could literally feel the Chi building and then it would just burst out the top of my crown. And this, and so this practice that you're talking about, when you're right at that point in the Tandava practice, this is at the point where where you're actually ready to practice being moved. So until that point, it's like Euclidean geometry or earth-centered space where it's only it only works for a million miles but the, this is a, a piece again from uh, from Steiner but also the Tandava practice that comes from the tantric tradition from the Indus Valley from 7,000 years ago which precedes so many of this sort of religious mumbo jumbo that we're stumbling through right now because it was it was matriarchal which doesn't mean that it was woman dominated because women collaborate. So women collaborate and share information, and they were able to move together until they were moved. And what happened then is they tie, they were tied into the collective, and they were able to move beyond a personal practice into something that became first interpersonal, and then group-related, and it became nurturing and healing. And then even on a global basis, not only was that possible, but it's still possible for us. And this is, this is from Ra now. Ra says, in one moment, we could all decide that we have shifted into the next dimension, which is the complete dimension of love. Those individuals who had not made that choice yet wouldn't participate at that level on the earth. They would, they as entities would, would repeat a third density experience to still figure out, do I want to serve myself or serve others? Because there's still sort of a, a mixture in their, in their beings. And then those, those few pe- people or beings on this planet who've decided to serve others, and there are very few, we sort of flood the channel with them in terms of legacy media, don't we? Mm-hmm. So it appears that there are so many more who are service to self than there are. But that's part of service to self ethos mm-hmm. is to be able to dominate 
take over communication worldwide as much as possible. And, and this is the only time in humanity we've really been able to experience that with the birth of, you know, these little pocket smartphones, so-called yeah, smartphones. Yeah, technology, yeah. But you have an overload of information without discernment. Yes. And this is the difficulty that we're in. Before religion closely guarded that information, before that, there were priests who closely guarded it. So whether it was a political system or a religious system or an educational system, the monks, there was always, always an individual sort of group, a, a power dynamic that guarded the information. Now, of course, we say that's a horrible thing because... Information should be free to everyone. The challenge is when you have information and you don't have the capacity to interpret it. Or to manage it, because information directs power, energy. And so if you, for example, you know, Steiner talks about the importance of evolving consciousness too quickly. And so the... Ra does as well. Yeah, and the example I gave in my Loose for Christ Aramon podcast is you know, how much information about sex do you want to give a six-year-old child? Because or, or how do you want to give that information imaginatively? Christ gave parables, for example. People mm -hmm. weren't ready to hear what he had to say, and he would have been killed a hell of a lot earlier. So if you give it with imagination, the child is left free. There's, there's a, a construct called oppression and teaching. Oppression is teaching is when I'm basically directing you to do something through me being the power dynamic teacher and you being the student. What Ra and what Steiner would, would absolutely concord on is, is that freedom is necessary. And so indirect teaching whenever possible is best. And so let's, let's just give a, an easy example would be we're sitting here having this podcast together and I notice that your posture is a particular way. And so without saying, well, there are two things I could do. I could reach over and I could sh literally shift your shoulders, right? Yeah. It's not, by the way, but. Oh, uh, just me hanging out. Right, right. You're just, you're hanging out. Mm -hmm. But I could, I could physically manipulate you. Yeah. I could verbally manipulate you and say, sit up straight. We or hear you, you could sit up straight and I would probably mirror you. Right. And the, and, but the, the nice thing is you would probably, if you wanted to, consciously or unconsciously, and if you didn't, then you wouldn't. Mm -hmm. And I would not interfere with your freedom to do so or not to do so. And that indirect teaching where you, you move a movement stream, the information of the archetype mm -hmm. who knows the proper configuration for bearing mm -hmm. uh, of the spine and, and all of the muscles hanging would be able to be present in that. And there would be a completely different archetypal being present if I come over and physically move you, or if I just tell you, sit up straight. And that's the difference between serving my own self in control and manipulation, even though it looks like it's helpful, I'm controlling. Mm -hmm. And the challenge is for us not to do that to each other, and even more especially, not to do that to our children, but to give them indirect possibilities. So we recognize that there's something that could be different. We let that exist, and then we offer a count, what Steiner would call a counter gesture to it. We offer something else alongside it. And the child in particular, but any person, gets to choose that and then feels completely free. Whereas me coming over and altering you or telling you to do something, we, I, I've lost my sense of treating you with dignity. And then I've abridged a relationship and I've moved toward a, a serving myself with the best intentions. And this is why Ross says it's tricky. Don't just think that because you're a nice guy, you're serving other people and you're harvestable. You're ready to go. <laughs> really investigate. How is it that, that I bring my service? Yes. Yeah. I think it's, it's, you know, parenting is so deep. I mean, parenting alone could be a very legitimate spiritual path and teaching is also a very deep spiritual path. Yeah. Or can be. Yeah. Well, it, it, I think it's, I think it should be, is, would really be the right words for me. Hi, everybody. I am so excited to tell you about Wild Pastures' amazing meat delivery service. They have beef, chicken, pork, and wild-caught fish. My family and I have been enjoying their meat for quite some time now, and I just couldn't wait to tell you about it any longer. We had an amazing barbecue this weekend, and I'm still high off the meat. And they use a whole network of regenerative farms, which means that you're getting a different ecosystem from each farm, which means a different nutritional profile, which means nutritional diversity, which means health and vitality, which is exactly what we need right now in the world for ourselves and our families so we can all make a difference in the world. 
And Matt Smith's going to tell us more about this amazing company, Wild Pastures, about their offering and how you can get it. Thank you, Matt. Thanks so much, Paul. And I'm excited to tell your listeners what they can get today and how we can help them out. So, you know, as you know, pastured meats are crazy expensive. And so our goal with Wild Pastures is to tap into this network of regenerative farmers and to finally create the solution of where we can get the highest quality meats delivered straight to your door for the most affordable prices around. And so we're on average seeing that we are 40% cheaper than any other delivery option out there. And that our customers have reportedly saved, on average, $1,000 on their grocery bill from meat alone. And so Wild Pastures is a regenerative meat delivery service that is solving this problem. And you can get 100% grass-fed and finished, as well as pasture-raised pork and poultry and wild-caught seafood from Alaska delivered straight to your door. So it's far more convenient. It's far more environmentally friendly because we're using regenerative farms entirely. We don't use feedlots ever. So the, the nutrition profiles are way better. You can definitely taste the difference. I know we were talking about this on our uh, just before we hopped on. You having a Father's Day barbecue and, and how incredible the pasture-raised chicken and beef short ribs were. And you can really taste the difference, right? I'm and still so, high. <laughs> and so our goal is to remove the roadblock from people's minds that if they want to eat healthy, it's too expensive. And so that's where Wild Pastures comes in is we are delivering with our own fleets of trucks whenever possible. We haven't raised our meat prices in over three years at this point, And we're really just creating convenience for the consumer and kind of being the high tide that rises all ships. If we can opt more people into a system like this, the cost stays down for everybody. And so there is a myriad of benefits that go into that. And so Today, if your listeners want to try Wild Pastures and taste the difference and experience what it's like, go to wildpastures.com forward slash Paul Check or click the link in the show notes and save 20% off for life, plus get free shipping for life, plus get $15 off your first box. That's a mind blowing deal. I can't even <laughs> imagine. I mean, I've never heard of an offer like that. And, you know, most people will hear an offer like that and think this can't be that good. But I'm telling you, it's not. It's not only that good, it's really good, or I would not be sharing this on my podcast. I think everybody needs to get a hold of Wild Pastures for their family, for their vitality, for their longevity, and for the future of this planet. So thank you guys very much. So Matt, Matt just repeat the website again. Sure. Just go to wildpastures.com forward slash Paul Check. or visit the link in the show notes and get 20% off for life, plus free shipping for life plus $15 off your first box so you can try it. You'll be glad you did. The word that I wanted to loop back to, and I'm sorry, listeners, it's taken me so long. You used the word catalyst. I think a lot of people haven't studied raw, wouldn't understand it. Catalyst is any opportunity for growth. So yeah, some, synonymous you, with trauma. Your wife is triggering you or your spouse is triggering you and you feel like you want to tell them to shut up or whatever, there's a catalyst or, you know, your house burns down and you can either go into a state of depression and think the world's come to an end, or you can use it as a catalyst to say, wow, well, now I have a chance to create something brand new. Or see the moon. Or yeah, or, you know, any number of possibilities, but the catalyst is really the, some form of challenge that presents an opportunity. Yes. And so- Crisis opportunity. Yeah. So you were t using the word catalyst before, and I was just worried mm. that non, non-students of Raw's lingo would, would be lost with that one. Yeah. Let me, let me make sure just to uh, put a note on that. What Ra says is, is so incredibly wonderful about the particular experience that human beings are in right now is we have the capacity to grow enormously, more than at any other of the, what he would call an octave of densities in this particular blip of time, which is 75,000 years in this particular level, he would call a third density, because we don't know actually what the hell is going on. We started with what is God. We're asking what it is because we don't know, whereas in mm -hmm. other densities, it's not only known, it's not even talked about. Mm -hmm. So we only end up talking about the things that we're, tr we're still trying to learn. And the catalyst has this incredible potential because of a veil that's been drawn, a separation that has occurred between us and the divine which allows us to separate ourselves in our thinking from other people or in our feeling lives. And again, if you're on a service to all or to others path, every time you create a thought of separation or an unloving thought to 
any other being, not just a human being, you're on a service to self path. And a restitution would need to be made for that in order for you to be at a place where you truly are in a service to others. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't know about you, but I know that I have to constantly, every day, watch myself. I've, I don't think I've ever had a day go by where I haven't judged something oh, yeah, or it's, reacted it's against impossible. whether it's a rock that you know I run into and blame it or a human being that I project my own unconscious shadows on. Mm -hmm. And so that process is what Ra is talking about. That's a, an extremely disciplined process. One of the things that helped me a lot was when I took nonviolent communication, Marshall Rosenberg's nonviolent communication training. Mm -hmm. And Marshall Rosenberg made the distinction between a judgment and an observation. He says a judgment always cuts you off from the other person. It creates separation, yeah. which... To, you know, will will lead to pain, whether it's conscious or unconscious, because it's an illusion, right? You can't separate yourself from anything in God. But for example, if you say that frat person is a real pig, that's a judgment. But if you say I observe that person is having a really hard time maintaining their weight, and that they must be frustrated, I would imagine they're frustrated or uncomfortable mm. in that. That's an observation. Yeah, it's still a judgment, but has empathy with it. <laughs> well, the thing is, though, is that. You see, when you look at what happens inside of you, hmm. if you're making a judgment. Well, you've made two assumptions there, and assumptions are judgments. So that person could easily disconfirm what you've said about them being overweight. Yeah. Let's, they may not struggle with it at all. They may love fucking eating donuts. They might. Uh, they might. But I'm, I'm trying I mean, I've to, met a few. <laughs> yeah, they're out there. I'm trying to focus just on the concept of judgment versus observation. And the, the judgment, think of judgment as a sword, uh, because in tarot, judgment is represented by the sword. Mm. That's why you see tarot number 11, Justice, holding a sword in one hand and the scales in the other. She has to make judgments. She has to decide what to cut out in order to balance the community. That's, okay. that's, the, the, that's the function of law, is to actually create balance and harmony. But to observe, for example... In my work with the Empress archetype and the Emperor archetype, when I followed Ra's system and I met with the archetypes, one of the things that I learned from the Empress was she said, the Emperor alone cannot make effective judgment because he is too rational and discerning. So she gave me the example. She said, mm -hmm. if someone reports to the Emperor that a man was caught stealing, and that's the only information he gets. If he's been caught before, he'll probably have him decapitated. But she says, I, as his empress, carry the feminine wisdom that he lacks. And I, as the empress, am more empathetic, empathetic and compassionate to the vibe of the community. Yeah. So she says, when I go to him and say, the reason the man's caught stealing is because his wife died and he's got two little boys and he can't go to work, therefore his kids without without him getting food are going to starve to death mm -hmm. so he doesn't want to steal it's not that he's a bad man he does not know how that he can take two take, take care of two children all day yeah. without somehow getting food and therefore it, do you really want to kill this man when he's doing his very best to fill the role of mother and father at the same time and he's not really stealing He's borrowing food from the community so that he can do the service of raising two contributors to the community. Right. And the emperor says, well, now that I understand it from that perspective, no, we don't want to kill him. We should probably help him. Right. Okay. Right. So the point is the emperor has to make a judgment, mm -hmm. but without the empress making an observation, he can't really make an effective judgment. So that's a simple way for me to create an analogy of the difference between a, a judgment and observation. The emperor sees the judgment. He's stealing, punish him. She says, wait a minute, you have to know the context. Here's what I have observed by being part of the community. This is what I know to be true from yeah. being in the community. And so the other context is, is that if we make an observation, that tree has a beetle infection, that's an observation. But if we say, that's a damn ugly tree, look at all those beetles, cut it down, that's a judgment. So one has to, one, one's making a distinction to remove, the other one's simply saying, look at all the beetles mm -hmm. in this tree, mm -hmm. 
but it's not necessarily saying I'm going to cut it down or I'm going to do anything about it. It's like, like I, I, I see your height and your weight, but I don't make a distinction is, is he strong or is he weak or is he old or is he young or is he too old? Those are judgment words, right? So I think those, my only point is for me, it helped me when I find myself judging, it helped me say, okay, now here's my opportunity to see if I can do an observation without needing to rank or or cut out or segregate. And that that helped me a lot. It made me feel a lot. I felt more love in myself. I found when I was judging without observation that I was cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting. Yeah. And somehow it makes the ego feel better about itself, but it doesn't actually make the soul feel good. Right. But I found if I observe and also when I switch to instead of look at that fat person over there, what a pig, I say that part of myself yeah. must be really uncomfortable. Yeah. Because I know if I was that big, I would be really uncomfortable. So now you're also building empathy and understanding. Yeah, so when I when I when I try to switch from judgment to observation and hold the uh, understanding which I've had profound experiences of that I'm just looking at another expression of myself, then it helps me shift into this more heart-centered orientation which yeah. I think has helped me quite a lot. I mean, I've uh, Bill Bill Gates and Fauci and and uh you know crew yeah. how do you how do you love them they've been really a great exercise yeah. for me because you yes. know there's there's times when when you know they they really scare me like i'm like okay these guys are out of control and you know the, the warrior in me jumps up i and it puts me into quite a mm. quite a you know like a really hall of mirrors type experience where uh -huh. i'm like okay how do you deal with this how do i deal with this much darkness uh, you know and 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 how do i remember that the function of evil is to uphold the good and that you can't have light without dark. And so I, yeah. I have to start carefully analyzing and, 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 you know, that takes a fair bit of work that most people don't want to do. Yeah. And even the word evil is pretty interesting because I think, it, I think it's more that monotheistic piece of this, this kind of dark God piece in, in, in more Buddhist traditions and in native traditions, it's more spoken of as ignorance. And I notice that when I use the word evil, I personally feel more of a separating myself from that than a sense of ignorance because I can relate to me being ignorant a heck of a lot easier than me being evil. Mm -hmm. And it, it makes me wonder, I don't know exactly the, the etymology or, or when the word evil came into our lexicon, but... It wasn't that long ago. Yeah. Whereas the sense of ignorance, it just, I, ask, I, I immediately have a sense of, okay, so if these individuals are acting out of ignorance uh, of, of creator, then how is it that I'm ignorant? And I can find so many ways, and then I'm immediately in resonance, at least with the fact that these are human beings along, walking alongside me on the planet in where we have ignorance. And I can use their awakening my own shadow to, to ask myself, why am I being triggered by this situation? Because mm -hmm. Ra's picture is, before you're unswayed, the response to every moment is love. And if there's a different response coming out of me than love, then that bears investigation. Mm -hmm. Which <laughs> leads to the problem that when you're caught in the industrialized world and you're constantly trying to make money and you know you're rushing from day to day to appointment to appointment and et cetera. And when you do get a minute, you just want to, you know, do Veg. whatever, whatever, whatever works for you, drink some wine, some yep. alcohol, smoke some pot, TV, whatever watch some it is, television. Go I to mean, sleep. I, I certainly reward myself at the end of the day with a chance to stop working because I work a lot and I th think a lot and I create a lot. And so for me, it's like, okay, I, I give myself permission to disconnect from having to have an output. But my point is that we've collectively created an environment in which we are chasing an outcome so often that we rarely have the time that it takes to do the kind of inner spiritual work that you're talking about, yeah. which is looking at our shadow, looking at what we're projecting, look yeah. at what, what we're judging, where are we judging versus observing. And that... that to, you know, I've been working on like building that into my life so that when I'm triggered, I say, okay, now let me 
look at that if I can. Sometimes I'm I I it's, it's as Ziggler Zig Ziggler would say I'm ready fire aim <laughs> right, and then I'm then I have to do it at night as I'm going to bed. When I go yeah. to bed, I do all my I I do what you talked about with Steiner. I go backward through my day and say okay, yeah, or not necessarily backward. I look at all the events of my day, and I say mm-hmm. where where could I have done better. And that, to me, is an important practice that's part of the function of the soul. That's the reflection aspect of the soul. Mm-hmm. And without that, then you tend to repeat painful behaviors over and over and over again and, and create more and more trauma in your life. So you just end up being, you know, multiple layers of PTSD as metaphor. Well, I'm just a just a little spark note on that. Steiner has this picture that when you do the Rookschau, certainly using the reflective practice to see what was done, and what could be improved, and then immediately shifting to, and this means I set my resolve that tomorrow I will, or the next time I see this individual, I will. Yeah, that's what I do. Yeah, good. Yeah, it's that that way. I mean, that's the whole point of it. Well, his suggestion is, is that not to do that can start to lead to a kind of depression, because then you're just reflecting backwards and going, look at me, I screwed up here, I screwed up here, I screwed up here. And if you don't set the intention or the resolve, then you just sort of start to fester rather than having a a way through. You've just described one of the most common problems with people that use psychedelics too much. Okay. Because the plant medicines show you all this stuff mm. where you're not living and loving honestly, openly, and, and to your potential, which most people call a bad trip, by the way. And then for me as a, a therapist, when I'm working with people in this space, I have to work with them in an integration process, which could be a meeting for a day, which could be several appointments stretched out over the series of weeks, depending on what the context of the ceremony was, why it was done, how it was done, the intensity, the duration. But the point I'm making is if if you keep diving into your unconscious and going into your personal unconscious and your your shadow and your you know your family trauma and all that stuff, but you don't set a plan to orchestrate how am who am I going to apologize to who am I going to choose to be tomorrow and and commit to that then what happens is you just keep going back and back and back and it's kind of like yeah and 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 the, and the problem is is you can go deeper and deeper into it mm-hmm. and so what you can get to is you can get to a point where you actually see yourself as so dark that you're you can make the mistake of thinking that you're not lovable and you're never going to be able to change. And that can bring on a very, very deep depression. Right. And I've seen this happen to quite a number of people because they think journey work is like a sport where, you know, the more you do, the better you get at it. Right. But the reality of it is the journey is not where the work's at. (laughs) It's what happens after the journey (laughs) is where the work at, you know, you you know, the journey is like opening a window or a door, mm-hmm. but the work is walking through it and, and changing, right? Yeah. And and that's, the, the, but the to, to loop back to the point, I think we've kind of got ourselves in a box because, you know, like in the Indian culture at about 50, they leave the workforce and they choose a guru and they go off and spend the second half of their life doing spiritual development as preparation to leave the world, to, to die. But in this culture, we don't do that. Mm. You know, so we don't really build time in for spiritual development. Uh, and we also have a, a Christian conundrum because corporate Christianity has, pro- has promoted the idea that as long as you accept Jesus as your Savior and ask for forgiveness for your sins, then your sins are forgiven. So what we end up with is a bunch of people that go to church on Sunday, ask for forgiveness, and go act like an asshole for six more days. Yeah. And they think that's all you got to do. And that that leads to the same thing as doing too many journeys, but not doing any work. Except it's a negative aspect of the journeys. It's, it's like I'm I don't need to worry about what I did because Jesus took the load for me. And and that to me is is one of the things that probably makes Jesus <laughs> roll around in his skin up wherever Jesus yeah. is at his metaphor, of course. Right. You know that's like oh boy, I got a problem here. Yeah. But. I wanted to get to a couple of other things because you and I have this innate gift of dialogue that can go on very, very, very long. And I and I absolutely dig it. I just wish we had more time. But as I said, we will just do more podcasts together. I wanted to, there's two questions I wanted to get on because I want to hear what Ra's definition of the soul is. And I want to hear how that juxtaposes against Steiner's definition. And I don't want to just talk about the human soul. I want to talk about soul as a concept. Okay. Because plants have souls, animals have souls, 
in I, I in my teaching in my studies of Steiner, there's a place in his teaching where he says anything with an inside and an outside has a soul, which begins with an atom. It's got an inside and an outside. So that he calls that the mineral soul in his model. So how would you generalize soul from mm-hmm. Ra's perspective, mm-hmm. soul from Steiner's perspective, and then anything you would like to say specific to the human soul? Okay. Well, I would say there's a lot of there's a lot of confluence between them. They both see uh, a progression of something being ensouled from the from the mineral level. From Steiner's perspective, what he sees is a kind of uh, the lower the being, in this case, like a mineral being, the higher the being that overlights it, the higher the capacity of that being. So, in the mineral realm, there's such a purity of of consciousness. Because there is no ether body, there is no astro body, so there's no desire body. There are no thoughts to just screw that that entity up, that mineral being. Mm-hmm. So he, that that being, it's in in a state of uh, very close to uh, pure beingness, as far as form is confer- mm-hmm. con- uh, concerned. We're not talking about emptiness and form and, and purity, and so that's why these higher beings actually are a sort of oversoul for that rockness. Which in Steiner's conception would be in the angelic hierarchy. Um, he would probably be higher than that because his conception of the angelic hierarchy is we human beings would be what's called the tenth hierarchy. Yes. The angelic would be the ninth. And so the way it works is sort of in a rainbow in that the angels, there's an angel overlighting me that's directly connecting with me right now. Well, I mean all the way, archangels all the way up to Elohim and, and that structure. Yes. Yeah, so th- so that's, yeah, that's where I was getting to just to give a picture to, to the listeners is, is as you move down to the animals, you're talking about a higher level and then a higher level. And so you can see plants. And by the time you get to the to the actual Mother Earth, there is this highest level of being informing form and overlighting it with presence. And it's it's a kind of consciousness, but it's not until you get to the plant do you have the capacity to strive and move towards something, mm-hmm. but not move location. Mm-hmm. Simply move, as you were talking about earlier, on that magnetic axis, uh, ver- uh, electrical axis toward the sun. Mm, okay, I think you. S- I thought you said magnetic earlier. Magnetic wraps itself around the wor- earth. Okay. The vertical is perpendicular to the earth, so yeah. all the plants and trees are following the vertical axis. That's why, for example, if you don't have enough humus in the soil or enough paramagnetic minerals, the polarity differential in the soil is too low. So it's like a battery that discharges. Okay. So you'll see plants when they start to die, they flop down mm. because there's not enough electricity to lift them up. Okay. To to stand them up. Okay. All and, right. And, and you know, it would be like if you run out of life force, your just, posture starts to sag. Yeah. Like at yeah. the end of a marathon, people can hardly stand up straight. Yeah. They're 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 too depleted. But anyhow, to continue. Yeah. So 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 in between those two realms of mineral, like rock, and and Ra, for example, talks about the capacity to enter into the everlasting rock in order to build the pyramid through actual thought. So you're looking at a subatomic subatomic unity with a being and a being. Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible. So there has to be a kind of a consciousness there, as, you, mm. as you're intimating. There has to be a kind of rockness that responds to the thought of the raw being to create the pyramid through yes. that capacity. Yeah. And in between that is what Ra used quite a bit, which are the crystals. So the crystals have a kind of a consciousness that stands on the threshold between that first density mineral consciousness and second density plant consciousness that's actually able to move. And in their movement is the movement of light. Mm-hmm. And, the, and consciousness. Yeah. And so the, the, the capacity for crystals to retain light and then to radiate light. And this is something that for human beings, that light radiation doesn't take place until actually much later in in their own evolution, which is what makes crystals such, gives them such capacity for both healing and balancing. Mm -hmm. Those are the two main functions there. But only in the experienced and crystallized entity, Ra would say, and that would mean that the the microcosm of the uh, seven densities that he discusses that we still haven't clarified is reflected in a microcosm of the chakric scale of the human being. And that when those begin to crystallize, then that crystallized entity can make use of the crystal for healing. Mm. But until then, you could use a diamond and get no results mm-hmm. for healing. And then moving into then 
the the animal density that consciousness becomes for the first time consciousness of a, a self-consciousness mm -hmm. in a certain way mm -hmm. because there's a consciousness that's able to move and have desires and due to the astral body and so for Ra those those animals and plants would be at that second density level for Steiner as well. In the third density level, you would have the, the human level. And now you have self-consciousness that's able to reflect and able to have a spiritual life and able to remember and make individual decisions. Whereas a group, a group monad is, is still overlighting the animals. When mm -hmm. you see all birds moving one direction and mm -hmm. able to shift at the same time, yes, yeah. a single presence is, is overlighting that. Now that we're now that we're individuals, we have the capacity to believe the illusion that we're separate, and that's that's in this third density realm. So when he talks about, of course, soul, Steiner most of the time is discussing in almost all of his six thousand lectures the human soul. Mm -hmm. Yes, he is. Yeah, he will talk about the mineral soul to the plant soul. He'll make a specific distinction. Yeah, and and after this time. Ra would talk about this human soul, this soul being, he calls it the mind-body-spirit, and that it, it became a mind-body-spirit complex after the veil was drawn. In other words, after we were not aware if there is a God or not. Mm. And so for him, the mind-body-spirit is very analogous to Steiner's head, heart, and hands. And so the mind being, Steiner saying there's a particular way that we need to work with the threefold human being with the head, the heart being the in a way, there's not a direct concordance because mind, body, and spirit, the body is the hands, the spirit is the heart, but it's, it's not as, it's not a, it's not, it's a little bit like apples to oranges there because both of their conceptions aren't, they're not entirely aligned right. in terms of the way that they see it. But that mind, body, spirit complex then graduates into, in, in the next density or realm of being after this this iteration we're having right now in a, in something called a harvest looked over by guardians to see are you all at such a place where you can be transparent to one another in the way that you think the way that you feel and the way that you act 100% of the time if you're if you have the capacity to do that then you start working toward how do we align ourselves with one another in order to go out and serve and in this case in the fourth density ra's picture would be that we serve other parts of creation. And Ra, Ra itself says, we have no longer any need to travel physically. We travel in thought and we radiate the love of the creator to 90% of the creation, or, or maybe it's even 100%, but service to self says no to that, no thank you, because mm -hmm. they see no point. They think love, love is foolish, to, to serve others is foolish, it's mm -hmm. just folly. And then having those individuals radiated out to rock and perceive, just as you perceive when you astral travel, what occurs in experience that those beings 90% of the time have received that and then moved that love forward. And that's Ra's main purpose for being. Yeah. Steiner doesn't talk that explicitly about something like that. He doesn't, mm. he doesn't come from that perspective because like you said, he's much more running around in the world from conference to conference, from lecture to lecture, exhausting himself, dying early, just working as hard as he can to spread this message from, from an earthly perspective. Yeah. Hi everyone. I hope you're enjoying the show. You know, the holiday season can be stressful for many people and a time when your normal sleep patterns are often disrupted. That's why a warm mug of Organifi's chocolate gold in the evening is a favorite routine for my family. It's perfect for winding down, relaxing, and setting yourself up for a great night's sleep. And with chocolate gold, it tastes like comforting hot cocoa without all the sugary buzz of regular hot chocolate. I was blown away when I realized Organifi had found a way to give us a chocolate evening drink that wouldn't buzz you up, but instead open the door to a lovely restful sleep. Nighttime is for full body recovery. This is when the body really goes to work repairing, detoxifying, and rebuilding cells that were damaged during the day. Each evening is the perfect time to relax, unwind, and enjoy adaptogens that support a healthy response to stress. Ease your body into a calm, relaxed state with nine soothing superfoods in chocolate gold. Chocolate gold contains reishi, known as the grounding mushroom, and lemon balm extract, also known as the calming herb, to help promote relaxation and restful sleep. 
what it doesn't contain is any sugar. So you can skip away knowing that you are drinking nutrition to support your body and not just a bunch of empty calories. Go to Organifi.com forward slash C-H-E-K-20. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com forward slash lowercase C-H-E-K-20 and use the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20 to get your 20% discount on Organifi Chocolate Gold. That's Organifi.com forward slash check 20 and use the code all caps check 20 to get your 20% discount for Living 4D listeners. I promise you this stuff tastes amazingly good and really is quite a trick because who would have thought you could use chocolate right before bed and actually relax? Only Organifi can figure out how to do that. And boy, my kids love it. And everybody else I know loves it too. Enjoy it. Have fun. It's, it's amazing all these different concepts. And I think one of the dangers of being exposed to concepts is that you become a believer and you begin to exclude other possibilities. And I think that's why, one of the reasons why I wanted to start with God, because, you know, Jung makes it very clear in his teachings that the Imago Dei is the archetype from which all other archetypes emerge. So from a psychological perspective, said simply, whatever you believe about God, uh, shall we say, stains every other belief that you have. (laughs) So if you're, if you have a, a, a Christian God that judges will burn you in hell and has rules and wants you to sacrifice your first child and all the other stuff you see in the Bible, then you know, then then you start having segregation, right? Now yeah. I'm I'm you know this is a problem with with you know if you look at the levels of scriptural interpretation, there's literal interpretation, which is <laughs> literal, <laughs> and then there's ethnocentric, which is my group against your group, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. if you don't have the same agreement as us, then you're not our people, and that means you're a threat to us. And that's where you get all the religious war. And then you have allegorical, which means there's something being said that's not directly being said, mm-hmm. which means you need more brain power to figure it out. And you got to sit with it, and you need you usually need a teacher that's wiser than you mm-hmm. to show you what it is that you're missing. And the highest level of scriptural teachings is inspirational, which means when you're reading all this nasty shit in the Bible, how can that be inspirational? Well, it reminds you what not to do. It says, well, you know, that's inspiring. I, I know that people that do that have a lot of pain in their life and bad things happen that you know, I don't really necessarily want to experience. So mm. it's inspiring for me to know that someone else figured that out for me. I don't need to repeat that experiment. Like, right. I don't need to go steal from people to see what happens. I don't need to, you know, sabotage people. I don't need to prostitute people, et cetera. I don't need to victimize people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, those are survival archetypes, but... I think that's tricky, right? Because you and I are both very much in our bodies. We've spent a lifetime, you know, teaching movement to to other people and healthy movement. And so I know we have a strong bias that if we don't experience it, then how do we know if it's real? Yeah, I think I think though I think we all have a, a an inner moral compass, right? So let's just take it to an obvious level. Do you need to go kill someone? to get the same kind of experience that you get when you're walking, running, jumping, or swimming. Mm-hmm. Well, nobody dies when you're doing that, right? Yeah. And, and, and you know, we were going to talk about evil later, so I can, well, I'll tie it into this context. To me, one way to contextualize evil is that which is immoral. By definition, a moral code is a code that is life affirmative. If you are killing life unnecessarily like if we if we have to kill something to eat it then that's moral because you're using life to support life but mm. if you're just destroying life because you've got a bad attitude or because you want to destroy other people's belongings to take them over mm. then that's not really a moral expression of consciousness or love that's a- anti life yeah i think that gets tricky you know because everything gets tricky yeah <laughs> I mean, when you when I think about individuals who, and again, there there are a few of them, but I've experienced a couple that consciously are seeking to bring more life to themselves by killing other people. This does exist. I understand it's like drinking blood and satanic cults and stuff like that. Well, I mean the the yeah, I mean the the sexual reality of what's going on in the world and in, in sexual enslavement and and in just ch- treating 
women and children, especially like chattel. But that does bring more life to those individuals who are on the, on the service to self path. Yes. You it, see what I'm saying? So it's, I, it gets I, tricky. I do. And I, but because that, most of those people mm. are beautiful. They're comfortable in their lifestyle. Yeah. At the expense of others though. Yeah. I, well, but they're, but the reality is what's beautiful and what's comfortable and, and, and resourced means more life has come to them because what their gesture is, is to absorb life. Mm -hmm. And they absorb life by controlling, by killing, by manipulating, by being extremely clever. And they're often, they have a beautiful and radiant presentation because they have absorbed all of that life and light. Mm -hmm. And this is what part, part of the creator's incredible generosity to allow beings to experience what they will experience. And what I, what I could circle back to for you is that is inspiring to me to watch those individuals yeah. so focused mm -hmm. on taking others' lives, taking their freedoms, because I look at that and I say, my God, I now feel inspired to move in my path with as much intensity as they're bringing to their path. And I'm going to love others as much as I see them loving themselves. I will radiate the love. They'll absorb it. Look, there's a, uh, you're, you're causing my mind to go crazy with counterbalancing comments here. <laughs> uh, one of the codes I use for my own self is what would happen if everybody did what I'm about to do? Mm. So I will put that question to you. Take exactly what you just said okay. and say, what happens if everybody on the planet behaves exactly that way? Then what you have in terms of a, a human situation is you have a negative fourth density planet because now you have a war of wills. All of those individuals have said, I will use whatever means I can to establish my own power on the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And so there will be a war of thought. There'll be a war of lack of compassion, a war of instilling fear in whoever you encounter and controlling them as a result of it. So it's, it's a soul spiritual war for an evolution for hundreds of thousands, millions of years for those individuals to continue in that negative hierarchical pattern. And there are planets that exist for individuals who have chosen that. I don't think it's possible for a very simple reason mm. in, in human conception, okay. because I'll ask you this, if you take that same mindset and raise a child with it, Will that child evolve into a functioning adult or will it? Absolutely, they will. They'll I, I function don't... exactly in the po power dominant hierarchy. They will be taught. There yeah. are individuals on this planet right yeah. now being taught with service to self values from their parents. Yeah. The problem is as though they'll have no other food. You see, right now we have service to other and service to self. So the service to self has something to eat, which is us, the service to other. Because we don't do that, mm -hmm. or we, we minimize that. Right. Okay? But if everybody's doing that, <laughs> then, then what you have is the Ouroboros eating its tail so fast it ceases to exist, because evil always leads to isolation, which is why Ross says, I think it's the fifth density, it has to change polarity or it can't evolve S in sixth density. sixth density. So When you're adding love to light, you have to, they just simply switch polarity Yeah. in an instant. But my point is, you see, it, it, it reminds me of an experiment David Suzuki did to okay. make a point to okay. what's happening on the planet. And this is maybe 15 years ago, I saw this and it was quite shocking. He was talking about the rate at which we're consuming the resources of the planet. So what he did is he calculated how many people are on the planet, how much resources are available, what's the rate that we're using them. So then he basically designed an experiment where he took that many bacteria relative to how much resources we have left on the planet Mm -hmm. and he calculated how long it took them to eat themselves into oblivion. And it wasn't long. And okay. he, he basically said we're at 11 hours, 59 minutes, and 59 seconds of human existence if we don't change the way we relate to this planet because we're eating it to death. And so the point I'm making is if you call the service to self, mm -hmm. the bacteria eating the food, but you call the service to other, the one keeps putting food in the dish, then the experiment keeps going. Okay. But if you take away the service to other and there's no one putting food in the dish, it implodes and life ceases to exist. I see where exist. you're going. So what happens on a fourth density negative planet is that let's say that I fight like hell with you. And, and then I clearly understand this individual is more clever than I am, has more power than I do. Oh, I have something to learn from him so I can become more powerful. So I now serve you. Because my only other choice would be, what, just to disappear. And so what happens is along the hierarchy, I mean, it's like the Amway sort of 
situation <laughs> we here. Have pyramid. <laughs> it's a pyramid scheme. Yeah. It really is. And at the top is the most powerful. But fighting takes place all along, all the time, because when I gain in power, I'm going to come back and challenge you. Mm -hmm. That's what my that's what my whole goal is, is to overtake you now and then move up to whoever Rilke has a poem. And he, it's I think it's called The Man Watching. And uh, it's, it, it's, it's funny to use it in this context, but one of the lines is, this is how he grows, by being defeated decisively by constantly greater beings. And that's a little bit of what this picture is, is mm -hmm. I am going to study you because you're more powerful than I am and learn every aspect. And then I'm going to try to become more clever than you yes. and overpower you. Yeah. But all along the way while I'm doing that, I'm serving your every wish. So you're getting fed. You mean because you're studying me, so you got to keep me alive? Because I'm enslaved to you. That's what happens in this, in this fourth density, is enslavement all the way down, mm -hmm. and then an attempt to overcome through cleverness and, and the use of power, to become more and more adept at the use of the light to absorb the light rather than mm -hmm. to radiate it to others. One of the things, though, that is a problem, and I use this analogy from my students to describe evil, I describe evil as excess yin. Yin is anabolic, it accumulates. Okay. Okay. So you're in the cold plunge, it draws energy into you. Yang divides its energy in, in every direction. So if you think of evil as yin, it keeps accumulating and accumulating and accumulating. Okay. But the problem is, is when it accumulates everything in the world, there's nothing left. Whereas yin and yang always accumulates and gives, accumulates and gives. That's why in the fish of yin is the eye of yang, and in the fish of yang is the eye of yin, because it has nothing to become but its other, right? Yeah. So yin has nowhere to go but to, accumulating has nowhere to go but to give. Giving has nowhere to go but to depletion, which means it's got, I've got to accumulate or I can't give anymore. Mm. So if you take enough people and they keep pulling into the center, pretty soon there is nothing left. And so you have actually created um, a, almost a form of absolute isolation. Well, as you as you intimated, this is why a fourth density negative planet is so difficult because their capacity for separation is what they each wish for, but now they're thrown together. And <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of a comment from Steiner: the first thing that happens when you die is you find yourself surrounded by people just like you. <laughs> And you stay there yeah. until you're absolutely sure of what you will never do again. <laughs> and so that sounds like a fourth density planet. We do the same thing in the Waldorf classroom. Yeah. It's called grouping by by type or by humor or by temperament. Mm -hmm. So the, the people that like to lean their chairs back and yeah. bump into people and really don't care, yeah. have somebody next to them in front of them who's doing that to them. <laughs> That's funny. And the people who are saying, oh, my leg hurts. I can't, th I can't see the board. Somebody next to them is going, well, my whole body hurts. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't even talk. <laughs> and and so that's why having a little larger classroom with enough of those groups and subgroups is helpful. But that's a little bit of a picture of that I, I get what you're saying about, I mean, it's kind of like a picture of spiritual mass or entropy, that this movement moves toward yin or toward absorption. Yes. And I think I oh I think it's good. I like the challenge because you're you you've let me know that I've oversimplified the point because it's not all a movement toward absorption. The, the movement of me serving you is the Yang movement. Mm -hmm. I will do and go wherever you tell me to go in this universe. So there's a tremendous movement outward coming from you to me until such time as I come back to you and feel like I'm ready to face off with you and see if I have more cleverness, more power, mm -hmm. more, more black magic, basically. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. It's black. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not a problem in terms of creation looked at from the larger picture. No, it isn't. But in order for that to exist, there has to be its opposite. So you can't have that, evil and isolation. Uh, there's no such thing as evil without good. It doesn't exist. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that Steiner says about evil, one of the characteristics, he doesn't like to define things, but he likes to characterize them. And he suggests evil is something out of time. And here's a picture of this you might relate to since you did the Aramon Lucifer piece, mm -hmm. is that we as human beings live in this particular area of our body. Mm -hmm. It's it's really this is circulatory rhythmic sphere. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what gains and builds strength for us. The heart and the lung is there. And the capacity for for our cosmic intelligence really resides in what he would call the spiritual heart, which mm -hmm. is more in the center of our being. Below that is the aramonic impulse. Yep. Above that the luciferic. 
Yeah, and you can look at it from the elements. Steiner says that the harmonic impulse comes in through the earth and water elements, mm -hmm. and the luciferic comes through the fire and air elements, right. which is what we're made of, those four elements. And what Ra says is that fire and air teach water and earth. Well, water and earth are passive, so they have to have... They have to be formed. In, in alchemy, they're called non-volatile, mm -hmm. and then air and uh, fire are volatile. So you look at Lucifer as the air mm -hmm. and the fire. That's expansive. Mm -hmm. The water and the earth is, has a contractive quality yes, to yeah. it. And so what Steiner gives us as a picture is sometimes we move into this contractive quality yeah. of taking substance and trying to make it even harder mm -hmm. into substance. So yeah. freeze the water. Yep. Turn the earth into a solid block. Melt stones to make steel. Melt stones to make steel. And this sort of contraction is, in a way, it moves toward a time stream that will move us into the transhuman age. Yeah, <laughs> it is. And where the other, the other possibility is that you move into this kind of ego inflation mm -hmm. where you believe that you're, you're a god, god lucifer <laughs> ahead of the time yeah. when you've actually developed the capacity to be a god so you're out of the stream of time in which both means of you've those. been tricked by a higher being <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> Who thought he was God? Yes, yeah. and that goes on for it a long time. For, it's turtles all the way down. It's, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can't fool me. No, I know. It's you know, you know. Just what rises in me at this moment is this: like, I would, I wish we had time to really work through this evil thing because I'd like to finish our chess game and really play this thing out. Because okay. I think, I think, not that we have the time right now, but sometime. I'm saying me and you personally. Yeah. Or on a podcast, because it would be a great... It'd be more fun on a podcast, because other people could Well, comment. I think so, too. It'd be like a real game of, of chess. Yeah. But the, the thing that I think is important for everybody to hear from an inspirational perspective is that no matter what you and I come up with or what our experiences are, we are in an infinite universe created by an infinite God, mm -hmm. and we don't have the capacity to see anything close to infinity. You understand my point? I do. So no matter what... Well, I think I do. <laughs> well, the point I'm making I'm just, is... I'm just being tongue-in-cheek, because yeah. how, how well do I understand infinity? Well, if you're thinking you've already departed from infinity, because you're cutting, right? <laughs> right. The, the point is, is that one of the things that I've learned through my spiritual practices and my shamanic journey work is that the minute you start believing something and you anchor your hat on it or your boat on it, that's the day that you, the flow of reality starts to create resistance yes. against you. Yeah. And you know, Lao Tzu warns the water will always wear the rock out, yes. right? It's all soft and flexible and feminine, but goodbye rock. Beliefs become concretized like rocks, that's what a dogma is, right? Mm -hmm. And a dogma is like a, a, a resistance to the flow of the Tao. Right. And so my only point is, I just want people listening to this to know that one of the great lessons from all of this is no matter how firm and good you might sound in your argument or me and mine, we can only perceive a very narrow slice of infinity. Mm -hmm. And that to the degree that anything you or I say in this podcast is troubling, mm -hmm. it's an invitation to those people to begin dreaming and say, there must be something more yes. to love's capability than this, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There must be something more to this. Yeah. And I think that's one of the functions of evil in the world is to provoke us mm -hmm. to go deeper into ourselves yeah, to come up with solutions because the you know the warrior in me wants to wipe out the Fauci's and the Gateses and the Soroses, but the wise man in me says it's one thing to wipe out and create a counterbalancing fact, like you know if you've got too much weight on one side of the scale, you got to cut some off and put it on the other. But it's another thing to embrace them, find a way to balance, but embrace them so you you don't yeah. negate their right to be what they are and who they are. And that takes a wise person. Yeah, it, it, takes, it, takes, a wi it takes a wise heart. It takes a wise, it also takes someone willing to sacrifice because there's always got to be a give and take, right? Yeah. Like there's, and, and that's really the responsibility of love. That's, mm -hmm. that, you know, love comes with tremendous responsibility. I think 
Yeah, that's giving love without any expectation to receive because you yeah. will not receive from an entity that wants to control you. That's a high level, right? Yeah. And, you know, and, and you know, you talked of earlier about the challenge of service to self versus service to other. And I wanted to interject then, but you were in a flow. But there's, mm. I teach a model, which is I, we all. First, you have to love and take care of yourself or you don't really have anything genuine to give at the we level. In mm. my model, I is one, you, person, the one that you see in the mirror. We is two people. So right now we're in a we relationship. All is whenever there's a third or more okay. to infinity. Okay. So once a parent, once you're alone, you're I. When you get married or have a partner that you're having sex with or relating with or someone you're doing business with, you're in a we. Mm -hmm. Once husband and wife have a child, they're automatically catapulted to the responsibility for the all mm. because what that child experiences will inf 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 impact every relationship it has. Yeah. So the point I'm driving at is that the service to self concept has to be the basis of we to the degree that you've got to look, I have to say no to certain people when it's time for me to do Tai Chi or to get in the sauna and take care of myself or to take time to eat a proper meal or to go work in the garden. Because if I just give myself to we all the time, then there's nothing, I, my eye mm -hmm. diminishes to the point where I'm now becoming codependent on the very people I am here to help. So it, it reverses the polarity. Instead of now being a parent, I become a child to my children, mm -hmm. <laughs> which mm -hmm. is really not a good idea. Yeah, you're not serving them. Right. Yeah. And only when you can manage we relationships effectively enough that it's safe to spread that way of relating out into the all. Okay. Are you really mature enough to know what you're putting into the all, which is why I say to my students, it's an extremely high level of responsibility to be a teacher because the instant you stand in front of two people, mm -hmm. you're at the all level. Yeah. And whatever you teach them that you have not done the work to really justify as authentic experience. In other words, if you're just passing other people's cut and paste ideas, like pe people reading the Bible as though it's fact, but never really investigating that, honestly, now you got to carry the karma for that mm -hmm. because you're causing a ripple effect. And that's exactly what happened to Ra. Yeah, there you go. It happens even to people at that level. Yeah, yeah it does. It happens all the way. <laughs> Yeah, and and, yeah. Then, and that what a what a like when you when you look at the dynamics of it. I mean, look at the size of the universe. Estimates are that I think even in the Milky Way galaxy, there's probably at least three billion planets like Earth, if I remember. It's either the Gal Milky Way or yeah. the universe. Ra has measurements, but I'm, I won't go into all those. Yeah, there are, there's a number of people out there that have done these calculations. Yeah. But the point is, is like here we are on Earth. We're a dot. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if a dot, I mean, if you looked at the size <laughs> of the universe and, yeah. and you could put it on a, a piece of, 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 of paper the size of a football field, you'd be lucky if you could even find the earth in there. It would, right. be, it would be so littered with stars, the earth would be like a, a, a moat of dust that you couldn't identify. But here we are having these deep, deep conversations about the totality of it all, about God and about what's really good and evil. The reality of it is there's so damn many possibilities out yeah. there yeah. and there's so many different dimensional realities that that we, I think it's important. At the end of the day, my compass that I try my best to use is I ask the question, what would love do now, right? Mm -hmm. What would love do now with Bill Gates? Yeah. Well, educate him <laughs> if it's possible. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I could go on a long thing of the list of things I want to teach Bill Gates about farming and soil science and, and what I want to teach Yuval Noah Harari about the soul and spirit. But I think that we're all here, whether we chose to be here or because we're God having this experience. But I think the best tool for keeping your compass tuned to due north is ask yourself, what would love do now? Yeah. And the other thought too is that, you know, the service to self path, the, the negative path, th those parents have to raise their children. And so there's a certain allow amount of nurture that they they themselves have to give their children, which isn't service to self, it's service to other. So I don't think you can truly escape the service to other path completely. No, I, I agree. Anything at, at, at raw, it's at high sixth density, moving towards seventh is not in purity itself as a being. So yeah. imagine where we are in third density. We're not even close. And so the level of purity has to approach 95%. That means 5% of that time is spent 
changing the diaper or you know feeding so the entity yeah. is still alive yeah. uh, or it may be not changing the diaper in order to make sure that that young entity knows that I'm in complete control over you and I'll create trauma whenever I need to but the feeding has to happen otherwise the entity is no longer able to have their soul controlled and then the service to self entity has lost his raison de toi the kids lost his remote control car <laughs> nothing to play with right Hello, everybody. Today, I'm excited to offer you a free lecture I created that can really help anyone achieve healthy balance with issues of exercise in their lives. This free lecture is titled Red, Yellow, Green Days, To Work Out or Not to Work Out. When you get to the gym and you're already feeling tired because you're low on sleep, have been working out a lot, or have just finished a taxing day at work, should you work out? Some people will re-energize from a hard bout of exercise, but others will not. But how can you tell before you start? In this free presentation, you'll learn why it is critical to evaluate your readiness for exercise, as well as simple techniques for evaluating the type of workout your body will respond best to. In this presentation, I will explore the effects of stress and exercise on the autonomic nervous system, and how crossing our stress threshold, or having high levels of stress or autonomic stress, affects different people in different ways. You will find out how to manipulate your existing programs to create energy uplifts rather than energy drains, as well as how to select exercise methods that will balance your autonomic nervous system and help you make exercise work for you and contribute to your well-being. If you want to be healthy, vital, and fit for the long run, this information is not only essential, but it is critical information seldom offered by health and exercise professionals. Those without this kind of wisdom often resort to biohacking to compensate for chronic stress, pain, illness, and injuries, which is never a good substitute for bioharmonizing. I'm excited to be able to share some of the wisdom I've developed helping thousands of people heal over my long career. To get access to my free audio lecture titled Red, Yellow, Green Days to Work Out or Not Work Out, go to chek.group forward slash work in. That's chek.group forward slash work I N all together work in and enjoy this free audio lecture. I think you'll find it highly informative and highly practical. It shares many of the methods I've used to help the greatest athletes in the world, weekend warriors, and just everyday people look and feel a lot better for the long run. Enjoy. We are all going through an intense world transformation right now. Uh, there is more exposure to evil than probably previously ever we know of. I mean, it might have been just as much during the Second World War, but we didn't have iPhones to tell us all about. In mm. other words, we we know what the Palestinians are doing with the Israelis. We know who farts on the other side of the planet. You got African kids that can't afford to eat walking around with cell phones sending us videos, right? So I, I, I don't know if we are experiencing more or we're just aware of more evil, mm. but there's enough of it now with all the things that have been going on in the world, it's pretty obvious that somebody's trying to wipe out life, period. Yeah. Not just humans, but life. Yeah. So can you share a raw and a Steiner perspective on what is happening and tips for how we can best manage and navigate through what's going on in the world right now? Because it's obviously scary for a lot of people. It concern concerns me deeply too. Yeah. And, you know, if, if you can encapsulate that in a few minutes from what's going on from Raw's perspective, what it is from Steiner's perspective, and then share either either a Raw approach, a Steiner approach, or just your own approach based mm -hmm. on your synthesis of those two, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. Okay. Raw's approach toward what's happening in the world right now is he actually doesn't really care about it. <laughs> well, I, I thought he was a... a, a a, a loving being. He is a loving being, and that's what's tricky, right? Mm -hmm. So it's very tricky. Because his intention is not to concern himself with the conditions of the harvest, which he said will be fetched with some inconvenience. And you might want to say what a harvest is. A harvest is a, is a movement from one level to the other. He would call it um, the third density to the fourth density, so the density of the human being gets to make a choice. Am I serving myself or am I serving others or all? You, you make that choice or you don't make that choice. So there are three 
possibilities. I'm still mixed. Sometimes I serve myself, sometimes I serve others. If I reach 51%, then I'm capa- capable of being service to other. Service to other, which is which is called harvest and which means that you have the capacity to stay on the planet when it makes its transition into fourth dimension. Now, is this transition into the fourth dimension a one-time event? Wow, it happens. Or are souls being harvested as they die through a phase of that's, continuum? That's wonderfully infinite. There are individuals who are coming to the planet who have third and fourth density dual activated bodies. There are individuals who are at the, on the planet who are capable of being harvested already at this point and choose to stay with their brothers and sisters and hope that more will awaken and, and serve others. Mm-hmm. There are individuals of service to self who recognize that they will be harvestable and move to another planet, which is fourth density negative, which is what we were having fun mm. playing with the ideas around yeah. earlier. A black hole is what it sounds like to me. Black hole actually takes place more in the in the octave uh, when spiritual mass is gathered, but I, we'll probably have to hit that one another time. I just mean that that uh, fourth density negative place seems to me like oh, it, it was a metaphor, wasn't it? Yeah, I was, okay. I was just saying it's it's sucking things into itself, and it's okay. it's just things are going to just get hotter and hotter. There. They are, <laughs> they, they are indeed. Yeah, yeah, and in fifth density, there's a bit of a, a capacity to work individually, but then when you move into sixth and have to combine wisdom with love, then those individuals understand. I need I need to shift, and I've been serving Creator the whole time. Mm, yeah, <laughs> soccer. <laughs> well, I mean, that is, you know, it's kind of uh, it's an interesting situation where the the shift takes place. But that's that's Ra's picture of I don't concern myself with the conditions of the harvest. I'm here to teach the law of one because that is abiding through all densities. Right. This is a fart in a windstorm. Yeah, so it's a universal kind of concept, a universal teaching. He's trying to give a picture of a progression. We mentioned earlier, I think you asked the question, something like, what's the function of life? And so he's trying to give the function of life. He's trying to give, I can't say from A to Z because it's infinite. I think this is where language fails us. He's trying to give that from infinity to infinity, this is what we're aware of at our current level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so his, his conception is that uh, at 2012, when the Mayan calendar ended, then the conditions were for fourth density were possible for us to transit. And then his projection at that time, he talks about probability possibility based on consciousness, as he can see all of us as one being. He doesn't mm-hmm. distinguish between us. He doesn't. He can't tell the difference between you and me. We are one for him. Well, then how would he talk to the the girl channeling? He talks through the girl channeling. Her consciousness rests with him. Right, but she, he was able to tell her about exactly what was going on in her individual body on many occasions. Yeah. Th- again, I think this is a longer conversation, mm-hmm. and, it, and it's off the point of what you're asking me, okay. which, is, which is tips. So he wants to give us the long view in order, I think, to give us a sense of understanding, because his ultimate goal is, is understanding and to be unswayed. And so let's leave it at, at that. We'll mm-hmm. just give that, because you asked me to do it in a few minutes. It's okay. And then Ste- we can come back to it another day. <laughs> yes, we sure can. Steiner's picture would be he, he doesn't talk about conditions of, of harvest. He doesn't talk about moving necessarily from one density to another. His is, is also, though, a very disciplined, conscious, stepwise approach toward the human being remembering that the spiritual world is foundational. He does speak of epics, though. Epochs, yeah. Epochs, epics. Yes, he does. Yeah, that'd be tough to. No, I'm just saying he does have a model. Yes. So the Kali Yuga, for example, the age of darkness, and then the age. So yeah, (laughs) there's a lot there. That's fun, but it's it would take. My only point is is just that Steiner himself he may not speak of densities, but he does has epochs or stages of transformation in which we go through different experiences to to gain different um, abilities, awarenesses. You know what we could do is simply reflect back what you mentioned earlier. You said something about angelic, you know, guardianship. So our in his picture, we're moving from a state of being human beings to being angelic. Yes. Tenth tenth hierarchy. From the tenth hierarchy to the ninth hierarchy. And so what that means for him is that and this accords completely with Ra, that we will work telepathically, we will work more in harmony, we will move from more carbon to silicon based bodies, more able to radiate light thereby. And our capacity to to serve others at that point will be something that we practice all consciously, all the time. And it will take an incredibly long time because we're all in such harmony. Mm. So That's it takes so much longer. It's going to take 
instead of just 75,000 years, it's going to take tens and hundreds of millions of years as we move up through the densities because we have so little catalyst. The yeah. catalyst is so small. Mm. I love you so much, recognize you so much as myself. I won't hurt you. How could I? Yeah. It would, it, it just, it would make no sense whatsoever. Yeah. It's a, it's such a, a, a hall of mirrors, you know, it's, it's mm. like this, there's no end game to God. Yeah. It's really just a- It's one big playground. It's perpetual. It's a playground. It's, it's a piece of art. Yes. It's a drama. Yep. Uh, with with endless episodes and or it's sagas. terrifying and horrifying. Yeah, it, depend it all of it's all of it depending all on of the it, way yeah. and you're the creator, so you decide the way you want to look yeah, at. Yeah, it. it's a it's a damn powerful experience. It's it's like you know, when you really get into it, it's it's like a twenty grams of mushrooms. Man, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, it's mind blowing, is what I'm saying. Yeah, it is because it, it you can't really conceive of God with a mind mm -hmm. because it's it, it immediately when you start thinking about it you're limiting yourself and you know th that's for a lot of people a big jump i mean to get to go from running your mind uh, your your life based on your mind to going into a no mind state which a lot of people don't understand because it's kind of a taoist eastern concept but it, for me, it means letting go to the soul. It means letting go to the God in me. Mm -hmm. Letting go to that which is more evolved than I am that isn't trapped in programming and isn't trapped in shadow, yeah. but also can see the potential in every situation. Ra and Steiner both call that the higher self, yeah, uh, yeah. which comes from sixth density where Ra is uh -huh. and turns to extend a proverbial hand yeah. back to our current state. And this is, again, what you're talking about when you're able to be in more than one place at one time, because there's also an oversoul. Mm -hmm. There's a mind-body-spirit complex totality. So there's a trinity of beings that are informing this conversation right now mm -hmm. between us, mm -hmm. which means you have three and I have three. Mm -hmm. Lucifer, Christ, and everyone. <laughs> well, there's another trinity, <laughs> yeah. and, they're, and they're also guides and guardians. Yeah. So the levels of beings who are participating is it's just beautiful. It is really... Uh, once in a in a shamanic journey, I I had a profound not only vision, but I found myself in this experience. I was not only in it, but I was outside of it at the same time. And I saw very much like the structure you see in in uh, theosophy, where you've got a lot of people, which has then an oversoul or a guardian that's a guiding being, and then there, so you take take you say say you have a thousand people in a line. And then each 10 of them is being guided by another being. Then, so you have a hundred of those. Okay. And then each hundred of those is guided by another being. So there's 10 of those. Okay. And each two of those is guided by another being. So then there's five of those. Yeah. And it goes up in a pyramid. Right. And I actually, in one of my notebooks, drew this all out because it was such a profound experience. And of course, then you get to the top and it's all God. And, and so, but in the experience that I had, <clears throat> what my soul was showing me is that what you call Buddha is this being, and mm -hmm. you're all inside Buddha's body. Yeah, Buddha is not a, a being. It, no, I mean, it's not, a, it's not an individual being. No, it's, it's a group being. It, yeah, but what my soul was saying is that the collective consciousness, the oversoul, if you will, of all of humanity is the Buddha being. Mm. And it was just a way to conceptualize it more so than actually like, you know, Siddhartha Gautama, the man, you know? Right more like a Christ being versus Jesus, right? Which I think is a huge distinction, which I point out very well in my Lucifer Christ Ehrman yeah, podcast. That is a huge because, distinction. Because that's a, that's a big... Uh, it's a push button. That's a problem. Button. Yeah. <laughs> that's a problem. Yeah, conflating can be a challenge. That's a one that starts wars right there. Yeah. But I had this vision and it was very, very profound because I could feel myself in the rank, but I could also feel myself outside the rank. Yeah. somehow looking in on it. So yes. maybe my higher self was showing me what it looks like to be insold, you know? Yes. Um, it sounds like that could be. Yeah. I, I've, I've had many conversations with my soul on the difference between the higher self and the soul. So someday we can bring that up. It'd be too much to get into right now, but mm -hmm. it's very, very interesting. But I can tell you real quickly, I started asking questions of my higher self and there were times when my higher self would say that's not a question for me that's a question for your soul mm. and so what i found is that my higher self wasn't interested in things of the mundanity of life like right. what, you know what clothes should i wear what how many supplements should i take should i take these my higher self was really only interested in in shall we say much deeper 
more linear, more overarching concepts. Mm-hmm. It's uh, you don't don't bother me with no. the small stuff. <laughs> no, <laughs> you got to solve. Well, for that. I mean, they're they're at Ra's level. Ra says yeah. we don't concern ourselves. They're going to be inconvenient, which means there could be incredible turmoil and world trauma, and they have no concern about. That's not their focus, and yeah. so they absolutely they just simply didn't discuss it and moved on. Yeah, it's almost as though it's like somebody getting really upset because their football team's losing and they're watching television and somebody that's more evolved spiritually says really don't even bother me with that right because it's so insignificant with yep. what's really going on in the world right yet people get so caught in it i mean they will burn buildings down and flip cars over because their team lost the super bowl yeah yet the rest of us people are like you know that's really what we call entertainment. That's not really important. <laughs> you know, you're not supposed to ruin people's cars and houses over a fucking football game. <laughs> Unless it's my Bengals plan. Well, there you go. You see how deeply see the, how that it's either see, nationalism or sportism, but but it's all fanaticism. It's, uh, whenever there's an ism, look out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If I've got one defense up, it's isms. It's like okay. I, you know, I always laugh. People accuse me of being a cult leader. I say, you obviously have no idea what I teach (laughs) because if you did, you'd realize how ridiculously stupid that comment is. I can tell you being here the last two days, you are not a cult leader. No. Not even close. I tell my patients, all of them and my students, my job is to get rid of you. My job is to teach you not to need me. That's the, what that's what Plato said about being a leader. Yeah. Yeah. The more you need Work me, myself out of a job. Yeah. The more you need me, the shittier I am at my work. <laughs> right. So calling me a cult leader means you are like someone accusing Carl Jung of, of being a, a Nazi or a devil worshiper when you really obviously don't understand a goddamn thing of what he's saying. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Any closing comments about where to find you, websites, upcoming workshops, anything you want to share? Um, you know, the one thing I didn't share in my biography was that I think because of my, you know, having four different dads growing up and seeing all the possibilities of how to be and maybe how not to be, I started uh, creating men's groups at 21. Right. And it's been, you know, probably a 35 year process and 10 men's groups later. And I've just I've gleaned a tremendous amount from myself and been able to offer a tremendous amount. And so there's a, an individual that I really have loved. I mentioned him earlier, Jared worked with him. Oh, Jared Picard. Yeah. Yeah. yeah work, he's He's work, been on the podcast before. We talked about biodynamic farming. Those mm-hmm. many listening will know Jason Picard, his older brother. So yes, Jared's a great guy. And, we, and, and uh, I don't know if his podcast, the second one will have come out by the time this one does or not, but Jer- he, Jared is somebody worth listening to. So continue. Yeah. And so he's got something called uh, Be Here Farm. Right. And through that, he's asked me to be the psychologist in residence to, he and I are going to co-lead a 12-week men's group program at BeHereFarm.com. Uh, yeah. Uh, Which so- I'm part of. Yes. Which you're going to join. That's uh, right. You're well, going to be our first uh, speaker. I'm, I'm one of the the men. Yeah, you're the you're I think you're presenting a dreamline, right? Yeah, I'm presenting on the dream. I think I am the first presenter. You are. Yeah. Uh, cuz you know, getting your dream right is important. Yeah, I'm super stoked about that. Yeah. So that's so that's something that will be coming up. And it, the only other thing is uh, Where can people look? Is that go to be here farm for that? Yeah, that's yeah, it's beherefarm.com. Yeah. The only other thing is you There know, is a I, podcast discount by the way for that. Oh yeah. Yeah. I yeah. don't know what the code is, but if you uh if it's not in the show notes on this podcast, look in the show notes for the most recent podcast with Jared Picard. Yes. And it'll be in there. And there's $500 off yeah. with the check code. Yeah. Yeah. So you can certainly look that up at, yeah. at uh, Be Here Farm. So that I'm super excited about that. Yeah. And, I'm excited you're in there. That's and, great. I, I feel if I was a man going to a men's group and I could have you as a man, like if I had a guy like you when I was in my 20s or 30s, the rate of acceleration would be mind boggling. You know, to have someone with your depth, your wisdom, and your life experience as a mentor for mm-hmm. a young man. I mean, I'm 62. So f- for me, th- even 40 is still a young man. I mean, I-, I look back on myself and go, it's a miracle I didn't fucking destroy myself at 30, 40, you know? <laughs> me too. It's like I'm 20, my God, 20. <laughs> Fuck. I don't know how I did it. <laughs> Grace, you know, grace, grace for sure. The, the grace of God, yeah. And these young men coming into the world are just amazing. They're yeah. just incredibly beautiful, earnest, and seeking. And so, yeah, I would love to love to see whoever's interested. Yeah, join us and and uh, I think it's fantastic. Yeah, we're going to yeah. have a lot of fun. I think, and 
Anything else? Do you do any private consulting or? I uh, do do private consulting. I uh, I just have a a very simple website, uh, edmundknighton.com. That's E-D-M-U-N-D-K-N-I-G-H-T-O-N. Dot com. Dot com. Yep, that's right. And uh, and other than that, I'm uh, I'm doing what Ross says, which is whenever possible, take time to reflect. Yeah, good. Um, don't forget to eat. <laughs> <laughs> you you already know me. It's only been two days. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't want you to fall so deeply into your spiritual development that you cease to exist and go, "Wow, what did I do to myself?" Oh, that won't happen. I love food too much. Yeah, I do too. Yeah, Paul, it's been such a pleasure. Thank yeah, you thank so you. much. Yeah, yeah. I I can't wait for you to come back and spend more time and you know, you know, me and you need to have hours of deep philosophical discussion because you know i agree i you know you and i both have studied a lot and so i think this like discussion of evil i'd like to play that out i really would and i know james tunney if you're listening this my buddy james tunney who's super smart guy Uh uh-huh he's got some real definite feelings about evil (laughs) yeah yeah let's bring him yeah, and so the three of us together, you know. That would be fun. He's a super smart Irishman, so yeah. when you... you, can, you <laughs> Only if we can drink first. You get him going, man. Look out. <laughs> but uh, I think it's all just so fascinating. I mean, it's hard for me to imagine anybody that's bored in life. I mean, the fact that you can... How could yeah. you get bored with all this going on? Which goes back to my saying I told you about, never trust a man whose television screen is bigger than the bookshelf, <laughs> the lever, right? Yeah. Because that means... You're you're uh, you're not paying attention. You're not growing, right? Yeah, yeah. You, if you want to get smarter and wiser, you got to study smarter and wiser people. And yeah. unfortunately, unless you're watching very good documentaries or Gaia TV or mm-hmm. you know something like that, television is just programming you to be dumb and controllable because it's the service to self people that own those stations. And that's you don't want to step into that trap if you don't have to. No, and you don't have to. No, you don't have to. No, yeah, I think. Many people ask me, what would you do if you could to stop the brainwashing? Mm. I said, I'll tell you what I would do. I would go to every damn television station and I would cut the power. (laughs) And I would set it up so nobody could watch television for about two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. And when they turned it back on, all of them would say, what a bunch of bullshit. Why were you even watching this crap? And they wouldn't watch it anymore. They'd just be done with it. And I think, you know, ultimately we just need to get brave enough to just disconnect ourselves from, from you know, the dribble and drabble of, of uh, diatribe, you know, yeah. Yeah. and focus on wise people that really have demonstrated it. And that's why I study people like Plotinus and Yogananda and Gandhi. And, you know, these people demonstrated a real commitment to life, to love, to God, to spiritual growth, to sacrifice. Uh, Joseph Rael, I mean, I could give you a long, I did a podcast to people that changed my life, which I think I listed 62 people those yeah i'm gonna check that out 62 people that touched my soul you know yeah i think that's what we all could really use more of and i think that's being in a men's group with you and laird hamilton and um even Al- britain and all the other guys alex gray alex gray my god i mean fuck yeah being in a men's group with alex gray talk about mastery yeah i mean you're talking about the highest level of mastery. creativity that's creativity and mastery and yeah. honesty and yeah. love and beauty phenomenal mm-hmm. and jason right I and mean, jason's a fucking tapped in dude man <laughs> that's yeah i'm pretty excited uh, it's hard to believe i coached him for 14 years i mean i look <laughs> at this guy and I'm like i got to learn as much from him as he did from me but he paid me i guess I, that's god's good luck for me <laughs> yeah you must have done something yeah. something good yeah work as love as a boomerang yeah all right. Well, I don't want you to miss your airplane, man. You got about 10 minutes before you got to hit the road or I'm going to have to giggle when you have to come back and stay another night <laughs> <laughs> and pay an extra day on your rental car. <laughs> it would be a small price to pay to have another lovely conversation, but right. I don't think my wife and child would be that, excited that's, that's, about yes, that. Yes, we have that. There's yeah. the service to others. There is the service to others piece. Yes. there. You see how they always go together. And they're tricky, right? They because this is tricky. the service to others. It is. It is. Yes. And don't tell my wife this one's more valuable, though, or I no. won't ever see you again. No, exactly. <laughs> yes. No, the, the, the Kali will get you. God, Kali right. will eat you. <laughs> all right. Well, lots of love to all you guys. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. I mean, I love, love, love hanging out with Edmund. And I mean, hanging out with you is like hanging out with Paul Levy or some of my favorite guys on the podcast. Mm. 
And I'm grateful for all of you to get to join us in this. You know, I really feel alive when I get to share these conversations with you. And I am thankful for all of you to to really just take as much of what we're talking about into yourself and be creative and ask yourself what would love do now and um, you know, use your heart to feel what you know. I don't know if I'm right. I just know what's worked for me. I don't know if Edmund's right. I just know he makes me think about <laughs> think about myself a lot, about my own viewpoints. <laughs> and that's what, you know, Likewise. all my best buddies do, you know. It's like, that's why they're my friends. They challenge me. And I enjoy challenging them too. Yes. So the point is, just do your best, you know. If you can leave the world a little better than you found it, then I think you've done something beautiful. And thank you to my sponsors for your awesome products, awesome food. Wild Pastures food is freaking awesome. Uh, all the sponsors' products are excellent, and they all really are heart-centered people that put money and energy back into making the world a better place. And thank you for anything you buy from the sponsors, because a little commission goes to me to help pay for the cost of running the podcast and and the time and energy that I have to put into it to make it happen so I can <laughs> pay my mortgage and feed my family. <laughs> Lots of love. And I, I would like to say I'll have a podcast just as good or better next week, but it's pretty hard to beat Edmund. So um, I'll do my very best. I promise you that. I'm sure I'll, you will. I'll talk to you soon. Lots of love. Our whole great spirit. We are safe. We are home. We are whole. Mm. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Edmund Knighton. You can find out more about the upcoming 12-week online men's group, Be Here Man, at beherefarm.com or email love at beherefarm.com. Be Here Man is a shared experience for male transformation and growth, focusing on somatic experience, observation, movement, and mindfulness, and featuring six live conversations between group members and visiting masters, including your podcast host, Paul Check, internationally acclaimed waterman, Led House. Hamilton and revered American visionary artist Alex Gray. Living 4D podcast listeners can save $500 using the code CHECK4D. So go to beherefarm.com or email love at beherefarm and be sure to mention the code CHECK4D. That's C H E K, the number 4 D. You can catch up with Paul on Instagram, TikTok, and threads at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living4d with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com or visit the Czech Institute site at checkinstitute.com to find Paul's e-learning courses, advanced training programs, and to learn more about the Czech Academy. You could read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. This podcast would not be possible without the support of our premier sponsors, Bioptimizers, Organifi and Paleo Valley, and our podcast sponsors, Ned and Wild Pastures. Please show your appreciation by taking advantage of their special discounts for our listeners. The links are in the show notes at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. And finally, if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review on the podcast platform of your choice. This podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Audible, Google Podcasts, and YouTube.